Good morning, and uh, welcome to today's hybrid meeting on aging. At this time, could you please place electronic devices on vibrate and silent mode? If you wish to come up and testify, please come to the desk and fill out one of these slips. And online, if you want to submit your testimony, you may do so at testimony at council.nyc.gov. Again, it is at testimony at council.nyc.gov. And thank you. Chair, you may begin. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Crystal Hudson, and I'm the chair of the Committee on Aging. I would like to thank the members of the Aging Committee for joining me at this morning's hearing on improving older New Yorkers' access to city services, and actually they will be right over. Um, according to city reports, older New Yorkers generally prefer to age in their homes and neighborhoods rather than transitioning to more institutional settings that are both less personal and more expensive. A recent AARP survey found that 77% of, of adults 50 and older want to remain in their homes for the long term. This desire to age in place combined with increasing rates of poverty, social isolation, limited access to high-speed internet, and limited English proficiency leave many older adults disconnected from city services. This is especially true for immigrant communities and uh, older adults of color who comprise a steadily growing proportion of the city's older adult population. At least 49% of the city's older adults are immigrants, the highest proportion in the city's history since World War II. At least 23 out of the 55 census-defined neighborhoods citywide have a majority immigrant older adult population. The city must meet older New Yorkers who access city services at a higher rate than other populations where they are in order to address their needs. Today, the committee is interested in reviewing the landscape of city services available to older adults in New York City. This includes the rate at which older New Yorkers access such services and how. The committee is also interested in learning how DIFTA, in partnership with other agencies and organizations, educates and assists older New Yorkers in accessing available services. Lastly, the committee is interested in continuing to discuss how the city is preparing to adapt its, to its aging population. This includes understanding the city's plan to respond to changing demographics on a neighborhood by neighborhood basis, especially as it relates to creating safe and affordable housing, developing livable communities, ensuring equitable access to services, and supporting the well being of older New Yorkers. In the spirit of expanding older adults' access to city services, the committee is considering three pieces of legislation. The first proposal would require DIFTA to create and maintain a Know Your Rights pamphlet for older adults to inform them of their rights on various topics. The second bill would require DIFTA to have OACs expand their programming to include linguistic and cultural programs relevant to the local communities in which they reside. Finally, the third bill does three critical things. First, it would entitle any person 60 years of age or older facing eviction or termination of tenancy in housing court to full legal representation at no cost. Second, it would provide financial assistance to persons 60 years of age or older for the purpose of paying rental arrears when such persons are not eligible to receive other forms of rental arrears assistance. Finally, it would require DIFTA to establish a housing support program for the purpose of providing tailored advice and support through case management services to persons 60 years of age or older who are at risk of eviction or foreclosure. One in three NYC renter households with at least one adult 62 ages 62 years of age or older are rent burdened. With record rents and increasing costs, we have a responsibility to ensure that older adults can remain in their homes and live with dignity. I look forward to discussing these proposals and other ways that we can work together to ensure that older adults are aware of the full scope of services that are available to them and that it, it is as easy as possible for them to access such, such services. Thank you to the advocates and members of the public who are joining us today, and thank you to representatives from the administration for joining us. I would also like to thank my staff, Casey Addison and Andrew Wright, and aging committee staff, Christopher Pepe, Chloe Rivera, and Daniel Krupp. I will now turn it over to the council to administer the oath. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Pepe. I am counsel to the Committee on Aging. Um, so uh, just before I administer the oath, um, I do want to note that hearing participants may submit written testimony for the record up to 72 hours after the hearing. And now I will administer the oath. Uh, Commissioner, good morning. Um, please raise your right hand. I will read the oath. Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth before this committee and to respond honestly to council member questions? Thank you, Commissioner. You may begin your testimony.
I'm gonna take my mask off and then I'm gonna get my back to this group then. Sorry. Um, good morning, Chair Hudson and members of the Aging Committee. It's great to be here. As you know, for the record, I am Lorraine Colte Vasquez, Commissioner of New York City, Department for the Aging. And I wanna wish everyone a happy National Senior Center Month. You know that we're trying to advocate to change that to Older Adult Center Month, um, just to keep up with the times. This month is the opportunity to highlight the impact that older adult centers have on improving the lives of older adults and to show the importance that older adult centers have in the community and also uh, to promote a positive image of aging, hence why we want the name changed. There are many planned celebrations throughout the month and to help us do just that. There were many of them already. And it began on September 1st with the Encore Community Services, who hosted a celebration for the community at Freedom Plaza in the Times Square area. And later this month, on September 29th, we will be holding a National Senior Center Month celebration co-hosted by the mayor at Gracie Mansion. As you well know, the Department, good morning. As you well know, the Department for the Aging administers a wide range of programs that enhance the independence and quality of life for the city's older population, as you well stated in your opening remarks, uh, Chair Chris, um, Chair Husson, that people prefer to age in place. Uh, a key component of DIFTA's mission is to ensure that all older New Yorkers have access to city services and programs, including our own, and barriers to services are reduced or eliminated, and that we do with many uh, groups. I also want to say that DIFTA does this exclusively in partnership with over 300 nonprofit uh, agencies in the community. Every day we work to connect critical services, benefits, and entitlements uh, to, the old, with older, to the older adults in need, including those who are neither members of an older adult, uh, adult club nor clients of, older, uh, of other DIFTA programs. This yeoman's task cannot be accomplished alone. As I said, DIFTA partners with uh, hundreds of deeply committed community-based organizations, sister agencies, as well as other counterparts in state governments in order to assure uh, critical services are accessed and accessible. DIFTA's in-house contact center, Aging Connect, also allows New Yorkers to speak with an aging specialist to learn about programs, supports, and opportunities available to older adults and their caregivers. Aging Connect was fortuitously founded in February of 2020, just a month before the COVID pandemic shut down our city and all of our aging uh, operations and quickly became a valuable lifeline for one of the most impacted uh, populations during this pandemic, the older population. In reality, we, are, we all will need to fully understand the benefits and entitlements that are available and how to navigate accessing those services provided by the government. Even knowledgeable people can find this daunting this is made even more complicated by the differences in eligibility requirements between state, city, and federal benefits, especially around income restrictions. Through Aging Connect, older uh, New Yorkers are connected with a friendly, welcoming, trained aging specialist, not an avatar, to find the answers to their questions and to be connected to diff this suite of critical programs, community partners, or other government agencies for assistance and support. Aging Connect staff are multicultural, multilingual, and can speak directly with older adults in Spanish, Chinese, and English. Other language needs are supported through Language Line, which can provide translation services in more than 240 languages. Since its inception, Since, sorry about that. Uh, since its inception, <coughs> okay, Aging Connect has received more than 142,000 calls from older New Yorkers, caregivers, and other aging service providers who have been connected to DIFTA and city services. In addition to Aging Connect, DIFTA's network of more than 300 older adult centers located across the five boroughs 
is another major access point to critical city services and other benefits and entitled. The community partners who operate OACs provide screening for Medicare, Medicaid, SNAP, uh, which is the uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, Nutritional Guidance, the uh, Senior Center, a Rent Increase Exemption, SCREE, and Home Energy Assistance Program, HEAP. In the fall, to increase public outreach, DIFTA is launching a public service campaign reminding older New Yorkers of the many services and activities available to them and encouraging them to return to the OACs, which is a topic I will touch on later. Additionally, DIFTA's case management program is yet another important entry point for services. Case management clients undergo a comprehensive screening and needs assessment, which identifies the specific needs of a client and in turn connects them to appropriate in-home services, such as home delivered meals, home care services, as well as our friendly visiting and pay bill of programs. Each of these are themselves access points to important resources and referrals. Ultimately, for the benefit and convenience of older New Yorkers, a DIFTA a funded program can serve as a resource and referral to other DIFTA uh, services and programs. From the Health Insurance Information Counseling and Assistance Program, commonly known as HICAP, which helps folks navigate the complex Medicare benefit system, to New York Connects, which allows a no wrong door model for long term care. We are fortunate that this mayor's commitment to an age inclusive city and interagency collaborations. Uh, and promoting government efficiency has led to the creation of the New York City Cabinet for Older New Yorkers, that, which will launch in September. This body will prioritize formal connections between agency as it relates to services for older New Yorker. Specifically, the Cabinet will review city policies and operation to eliminate age uh, related barriers or discrimination to create joint action and innovation among city agencies in relation to aging services and to develop cross agency solutions to uh, address challenges facing older New Yorkers today and well into the future. DIFTA will serve as the lead organizing and convening agency and we anticipate that many partnerships will be forged as a result of this cabinet. I look forward to providing ep uh, updates to this committee and to the chair on the progress of the cabinet, uh, specifically around housing and benefits. Uh, we will hold the inaugural convening later this month. In the meantime, I want to offer a sampling of some of the collaborations that already exist among our sister agencies. For, for instance, DIFTA is working with the New York City Department of Education to develop and include an anti-ageism content as part of their inclusion curriculum and resource guides. The intention is to promote positive, diverse, inclusive views on older adults to school-age youth and to reshape views on aging in older adults. This is the first of its kind, so we think that imprinting aging as a way of life and the benefits of it and the respect that we should have for it are important. We are firm believers that ageism can be eradicated. Well, not for the short term, but we definitely can tackle it and attack it bit by bit. We acknowledge that young people have an important role in our efforts to achieve this goal. DIFTA also recently worked with the Mayor's Office of Chief Technology uh, to help bridge the digital di uh, divide. In addition to 10,000 uh, tablets distributed in partnership with the CTO and NYCHA uh, to disconnected older uh, New York public housing residents, we also distributed 10,000 Wi-Fi equipped tablets to non-NYCHA older adults living in tree communities. While the COVID-19 pandemic made it made us all feel isolated and cut off from our support networks. It was particularly hard for older adults who experienced higher rates of social isolation over the past three years. These tablets have provided a needed resource for older adults and underscored the benefits of collaboration across sister agencies to address this critical need. We're also working with the CTO on the affordable accessibility uh, for, to the internet. The thing that's important about this is that we know that this program is, is important and we will continue to distribute uh, tablets. We have 
about 3,000 more to distribute in the coming months. Additionally, DIFTA recently formalized an MOU with the New York Police Department that will establish a pilot around sharing crime victim data beginning in September so that DIFTA can provide counseling, crisis intervention services, and support for cases identified by NYPD who were not known to DIFTA's elder justice program and now who can be integrated into the aging support serve network. With hopes to eventually expand citywide, this pilot program will focus on victims in Manhattan north of 59th Street, as well as in Chinatown. This expansion of the elder justice program and a newly formalized MOU with the NYPD will expand across these critically important supports for older adults who are victims of abuse. We are working closely with the New York Department of Health and Mental Hygiene and the Department uh, and Health and Hospitals Corporations to uh, educate uh, geriatricians and primary care physicians on the range of DIFTA services. We have an ongoing training program with them. The intent is to help address the social and economic determinants of health of the older adult, connecting them to social and health uh, services needs that are necessary to me remain well and active in their community. Ongoing sister agency partnerships include the Department of Housing, uh, Preservation and Development, the Human Resource Administration, HRA, the Department of Youth and Community Development, which we have just engaged in some very interesting intergenerational efforts, and the Department of Citywide Administrative uh, Services, DCAS, which has launched with us a program for all its uh, human resource workers to train them on ageism and all their, it's DEI officers to ensure that they include ageism as part of the DEI work, which is a major step. Um, among key tenants of these collaborations, the Cabinet for Older New Yorkers and DIFT in general help to ensure aging services evolve with the needs of older adults. And they are, as previously stated, not just access, but also accessible. I believe that this is consistent with the intent of today's hearing as well as with the inductions, introductions, I'm sorry, of today's agenda. The three pre-considered bills being considered today include T2022, oh, T2022, 1650, which would give older adults access to free legal representations in the instance, instances of eviction, expand our rental area support and establish a housing program at DIFTA. T-2022-1538, which would create a Know Your Rights pamphlet. And T-2022-1696, which would expand culturally competent programming at OACs. While we, are in generally, uh, while we are generally in support of the intent of these bills, we look forward to working with you and your team to identify best paths forward to achieving their stated goal. DIFTA does extensive work to ensure older adults have access to programs, as well as other city services. We recognize, however, that there, are m there is much more to be done in order to increase outreach efforts and to further the utilization of our services. Hundreds of older adults and their families do not understand the full extent of government or nonprofit <coughs> services available to them because they've never engaged with them throughout their lives. We will continue to engage our network of aging service providers and the many advocates we work with and sister agencies uh, to help in much needed outreach efforts, which support access to government services. Many of you in the council have already disseminate information uh, through your channels, through all your franking privileges. Um, do they call that at the city level? No, they don't call it that. <laughs> it's only those of at the state, okay. Your newsletters and your monthly newsletters. Um, and we asked to come up with a structured way that we can provide information to your constituents through those newsletters from the Department for the Aging either on current topics of interest, but also the regular information, because we need as many entry points and informational outreach points as possible. So we look forward to you. And we welcome working with you to, uh, to include this information in our current Older Adult Bill of Rights. As always, we are grateful to the chairs and the committees for your advocacy and continued partnership to support older New Yorkers. 
Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner. Uh, before we jump into questions, I'd just like to acknowledge that we've been joined by Council Members Linda Lee, uh, Lynn Schulman, Kristen Richardson-Jordan, Eric Dinowitz, and Chris Marte. Um, for those who are here with us in person, please complete an appearance card if you'd like to testify if you haven't done so already, and you can find them at the desk here with the Sergeant at Arms. Okay, wonderful. Um, I will start with some questions and then I'll turn it over to my colleagues. At what rate are older New Yorkers accessing city services? Uh, Commissioner. Um, DIFT evaluates the way in which older New Yorkers access services provided by the agencies. And these include a variety of things. One of them is our home delivered meals programs. The other ones is the referrals to case management agencies, and then the access to older adult clubs, and the responses uh, of inquiries to Aging Connect. So we collect data on all of those systems. And then we are pleased to state that older New Yorkers who need home delivered meals um, begin receiving them quickly as, as once um, it is identified by the caseworker. And Aging Connect has a high response rate from the time a call is received till the time the action is taken. We also monitor that. And the other thing that we monitor is complaints from 311, any complaints or inquiries from 311. We give ourselves, I believe it's a 14 day period by which to respond and take action on that. Hi. And take action on that, on that uh, a complaint or issue. Do you have any um, statistics for how older New Yorkers are accessing senior uh, city services over the past five years? We can get that to you. Okay, thank you. And what would you say are the most in-demand services among older adults? The most in-demand services are older adult programs. Uh, right now, the demand has dwindled because we're still in this COVID mm -hmm. process, and that's an issue that I would hope that we both can address so that we could increase the participation in older adult clubs. But it's the older adult programs, it's the services, the activities, the trips, everything that's centered around the older adult club. The other was is home delivered meals. As a matter of fact, if we looked at pre-pandemic uh, participation, home delivered meals participation and older adult club participations ranged around the same 22 to 25,000 older adults. And case management services is another uh, highly utilized program. Okay, I have a fairly simple question for you. Several DIFTA vital initiatives and services, including Aging Connect, have lengthy URLs. Would it be possible to shorten those URLs similar to access.nyc.gov? Well, uh, yes, of course. Okay, thank you. And, um, and we will, and one of the things that, that the agency knows is that I'm the best test case. If I could, if I could navigate it, then it is simple enough for anyone to navigate it. So it is the it's the kind of thing that we're constantly improving. Yeah, and it's the stuff that we overlook because it's been in existence right. for so long. Exactly. So we welcome feedback and thank you for the one on on the senior employment, and you know we we do a continuous improvement. Okay, great. Thank you. Does DIFTA actively engage, coordinate, and partner with all city agencies on at least an annual basis? Yes. I know you got to this a little bit. Yeah. Um, and where do you see gaps in the delivery of city services to older adults? Um, you can be honest. Yeah, no, I'm always, I'm always I'm honest just, with I'm you. Just um, <laughs> I think some of the gaps we have are in transportation. Um, I think... Um, Another gap in service, which I think, you know, it's what we're talking about lately and in the last hearing, which is access and entry points and outreach. I think that is, that is uh, a concern. And I think, I don't think of it as a gap, but which is why I really welcome this cabinet, because when we start looking at the growth and we're projecting the growth, you know, that it'll be over 1.8 million, I think, or 1.9 million mm -hmm. in 2030, that we need to start preparing for that. So I think those are the things that are ever, ever present on our mind. Thank you. 
Um, just going into case management, according to DIFTA's website, older adults may work with a case manager or social worker who can perform a phone assessment and visit to coordinate services. And while such case managers do not charge for their time, depending on income, some older adults may be asked to pay a fee or to make a suggested contribution for some services. Can you please describe such income ranges, the cost of such a fee and or suggested contribution, and for which services? Yes, yeah, so I want to make a real distinction for the record that it's not a fee. It's a contribution, right? And it's a suggested contribution. Um, and it is determined basically on the income scale of the individual. Um, and it is um, the case manager will review the income levels and the, and the contribution to that. And it's a gradual income scale, but, and that's determined by the New York State <coughs> Office on Aging. Um, and, you know, it also is income-based, but it also takes into effect uh, housing costs, which are very different in New York City than in, across the state. So it is based on a sliding scale based on their, uh, on their income. Okay. Thank you. Um, and then uh, I'll pause here for a second. I want to allow Councilmember Dinowitz to ask a few questions. I know he's oh, got to run for um, okay. an event in his district. Right. No, okay. Hi. How are you? I'm fine. Good. Glad to hear. I have two si like simple, easy questions. Go ahead. Uh, the first uh. is <laughs> the first is the, the I'm interested in the cabinet for older New Yorkers. Who's on the cabinet? We have identified 17 key agencies that interact with aging service with older adults in New York. So, for example, it's NYPD, Department of Education, DYCD. Um, uh, Department of Transportation because of all the pedestrian safety issues. Uh, uh, did I just say HPD? Did I say that already? No. Yeah. Okay, so um, it's transportation. It, I'll give it's, you a Okay, yeah. It's, it's 17 city of agents. them, but yeah. there's key agencies that, inter that really affect the life of the older adult. And it's to look at their services, and it has two purposes, as I said earlier. First is to see if the policies and practices have any barriers in them, right? To so eliminate those. And then to start looking at how do we facilitate, you know, the services, the access to it? How do we impact policy? What if the, you know, like with HPD, we had the universal design. It took us years to get there. Mm -hmm. But universal design is now part of every new development. And then we are looking at the end of pedestrian safety came out. You know, so it's looking at expanding things like that, impacting policy, and basically looking for vision for the future. Okay, and when when did that cabinet the begin? mayor launched that the mayor gave the authority to launch that cabinet in July. Okay, so it's new. Okay. Oh no, no, it's brand new. It's brand new. Right. Okay. All right, cool. It's brand new. It's and have, brand, have no, it's so brand new that it hasn't launched its inaugural meeting. That'll happen later on right. this month. And and I'm wondering what direct feedback you if at all, or you plan to with the, with the cabinet directly from older adults and directly from the centers, because there's, there's <clears throat> excuse me, um, I, would, I would be concerned. I know you haven't met yet, but I, I want to make sure that there aren't too many degrees of separation between the bureaucracy and the actual direct needs of the people, of the older adults that, that we're all supposed to serve. And I'm wondering how the cabinet uh, seeks to address that no you know having a little uh bit humbling themselves a little knowing that you know we here in a room like this don't always know directly Absolutely. what are older adults need without actually talking to them so how do you plan to include directly so their voices thank you for that question and i thank you for the thoughtfulness of that question um we can't plan without knowing what's necessary from the most people affected by it I've been in a community that did that for too long in East Harlem to its residents, all right? And so um, what I will say to you is we have two vehicles for doing that. One of them is the Department for the Agents Advisory Council so that they will constantly give us feedback on, on, on that. And by the way, you have, six, you have some vacancies that we want you to fill on that council. Um, the other thing that we also will do is we will we are developing now um, 
a client survey, client information, and that we'll use those kind of instruments regularly to get input from people on what the directions are. And you know what, you just gave me an idea that we may come up with a way of including for some of the work groups, how to include older adults in those work groups, okay? Yes. Right, thanks. I'm, I'm glad, thanks. Um, and my second question, you, so, you sort of alluded to this um, toward the end when you mentioned youth programming. I, I'm excited about, you know, training, education, um, intergenerational, uh, you, you know, things, De the DEI training for including that in the curriculum. I here it is. For the, for uh, the HRA. In the, in the DOE. Well, in the, the DOE. DOE and, and what you said, that to develop and include anti-ageism content as part of the inclusion curriculum and resource guides, which I think is great, uh, a great step for, for, the DOE, for, the, for, our, for our children and the DOE. Um, I'm wondering, so teaching things to children is one thing, and then doing things with children is another thing. So I'm wondering if what sort of guidance you give to older adult centers or what programming you, DIFTA, engages in directly, if at all, or what plans you have to do it, I don't know, um, to engage directly with the youth so that not just learning about it and being aware of ageism, but experiencing uh, activities with older adults to address ageism, but also like, you know, it's good for everyone. Yeah, <laughs> right. So, and it, that's the best way of debunking misinformation, right? Is if you have first-hand experience or if you acknowledge, you acknowledge <coughs> it, right? So there's two ways that we do that. First of all, our foster grandparent program is one of the most exciting, I would say, and impactful intergenerational programs where we connect older adult who act as grandparents to children at risk and many children who are hospitalized, right? And so I think that's a connection. I think the other way that we've done that is through a regular program with the Summer Youth Employment Program. At uh, all of the um, older adult centers were offered youth employment, you know, uh, youngsters this summer, and that is something that we continue. We had 37 of them at the Department for the Aging, and I have to tell you, it was exactly that. We did a survey. Well, it was a session with them, and we said, what were your attitudes about aging before you came here? And they were like everything that we've, all of the disparaging remarks that we've all experienced. Some of us have experienced, and many of you have heard. And yet, that experience of being at the Department for the Aging, not so much of being with older people, but with um, just hearing about the need and hearing about the services altered their perspective. And some of them were dramatic alterations because one youngster said, I have my grandmother, I never speak to her because she bores me kind of thing. And it was sort of like, well, you're the boring one. <laughs> um, but anyway, you know, it was like, you know, if you're bored, it's about you, not about the other person. But we had this whole conversation and it was, to me, it's one step at a time. And if we could do that over and over and over again, it's those kind of things that we have to do. So we're currently looking at DYCG, working with them very actively uh, on coming up with intergenerational programs, particularly in those places where we're co-located, because many of our facilities are located in the same building. Um, and so we're looking at ways of partnering and creating intergenerational programming as an ongoing sustainable, not one-off little sweet projects, but an on, ongoing sustainable effort. And I would just say, I know my time's up, I mean, just one more idea, sure, Go for it. Um, is uh, I, I have heard from many, you know, as you're in your council, your interagency council, cabinet, uh, cabal, whatever you want to call it, um, <laughs> Not a cabal. <laughs> <laughs> well, that voice it might be. I don't know. Um, is I've spoken to a number of older adults who've expressed interest to me that they want to volunteer in our public schools. And we're at a time when class sizes are, are very high. And our older adults pro probably, <laughs> they passed high school, so they're probably, you know, know their stuff. Um, they want to volunteer. They want to help in their communities. And our students need a lot more human support and our schools need a lot more human support and the, there doesn't appear to be enough central support for whether you want to call it a program or, or just or just support in, in making sure that if background checks are needed whatever it is um, and I think it would be a really great opportunity both for our children and our older adults not just to address uh, ageism 
uh, but to address mental health for our older adults being with younger kids and to address um, academia and social emotional support for our younger children as well. Um, if DIFTA can collaborate with the Department of Education um, to provide that support or to create a program that does allow older adults to easily say they want to volunteer uh, f uh, to, to help our kids in our public schools. So you would be pleased to know that we had this conversation with David Banks. I'm very pleased. And uh, one of the things that David Banks and I, uh, Chancellor David Banks and I agreed to was that we were going to do this on real time, not on bureaucratic time. And so there are three initiatives that we started. The first is looking at curriculum. And if you know curriculum, it takes a long time at, the, at DOE to develop. I was very pleased that this is, is now at an accelerated pace and so that we're able to do this for junior high school students. The other thing that I'm very pleased to say is that we're looking at, uh, as part of the substitute teacher pool, is looking at older adults uh, to serve as substitute teachers. We have many people who are trained and able to do some of those work, some of that work. And then the the, the other thing that we're looking at is exactly what you were talking about, council member, is to look at where can we put uh, older adults in relationship with children, either to help with reading, to help with, you know, just after, after school activities or whatever. It's just to come up with a structured way. I think that one is going to be a little longer term because of what you talked about, all the clearance and the requirements, but we're seriously looking at how do we structure that because we have a model. We have the foster grandparent model. And so how is it that we build on that and change that to a school setting? And so it's, it, it's something that we're looking at, and we want it to be sustainable. Thank so. you. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member Dinowitz. I'm going to jump back into some questions, and then we'll give my colleagues an opportunity to ask a few more. Um, can you describe any trainings that OAC staff are required to take to ensure cultur culturally responsive and competent services? Sure. Um, there's the, there is the mandated state and city required training, such as EEO and sexual harassment training. In addition, um, the, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to answer your question, but also make a statement that in our RFP, um, culturally competent services and language provision was part of the RFP. So it's, it's now a contractual obligation in, in our older adult clubs. So I just want to put that in context. But the other thing that I would want to say is that, um, and we're required, you know, if you have 10% population or more that, that speaks a particular language, uh, then those services have to be provided in that language um, and, or attentive to that language and the cultural needs as well as the religious needs. But we also have training that any older adult club that serves food, the staff have to be a licensed food handler by New York State Department of Health and Hygiene. We also have the emergency preparedness response that requires two staff members at every OAC to be trained to use uh, CPR and, and defibrillators. We also have uh, training on the COOP, which is the emergency preparedness plan that each agency has to develop of what to do in case of an emergency, and that is reviewed annually by us and, uh, and, um, and then give it back to them, but they have to put that in place. We also require Local Law 23 that all uh, uh, older adults having uh, contact with older, uh, all old staff having contact with older adults have uh, sexual abuse uh, training, so I mean, um, sorry. Uh, Older abuse, uh, old elder abuse training, so that they could identify, you know, the symptoms of an older adult who may be experiencing elder abuse. Well, both both are relevant. Huh? Both, both are relevant. Both are say. relevant, and sexual harassment is part of mm -hmm. the training. And then uh, they're also um, staff is trained just for cultural competence is to also learn how to use an interpreter. You know, not to the common era is they're saying what they mean you know, as if the person is not there. Uh, so how, how to use an interpreter uh, sensitivity, uh, with sensitivity, and also how to use the language access uh, instruments. Okay, thank you. Um, can you describe the culturally responsive and competent program that's offered at older adult clubs? Like, how does DIFTA determine what type of programming to offer where? Do, the, um, do older adults 
yeah. have any involvement in the decision making process or yeah. around what type of programs are offered? So great. Uh, I'm going to take I'm going to take the service provision first, and then I'll talk about how those are designed and developed and okay. the older adult part in it. Right. So first of all, as I said earlier, the RFP now puts that in. The RFP put that in contractual language. So if you have a contract, that's a requirement now. Um, but you know the services have evolved over time. When older adult centers started originally, the main service was to address food insecurity, so it was meals. And with time, then the older adult uh, act then added recreational and educational services, and so that was added. And then with time, they've added transportation services, and that's what. So it always has evolved with time, right? And it continues to evolve. You know whether it is, you know. What was it? 2009 was when the department started the geriatric mental health services, and so you know, it you started seeing as needs came up and as issues rose. That is how it was determined how we, what services should be included. How should we expand those services? And uh, same thing with our classes. And the one thing that I can tell you is technology. You know. We've always had computer classes and we've always had some technology classes. It wasn't until COVID that we saw the need for virtual programming and the need for, for digital training for older adults. So that expanded exponentially, all right? And so, um, and also to make sure that those languages are in the, those programs are in the preferred language of the individuals participating. Um, and so um, the other way that we build in cultural sensitivity, which is from my multicultural leadership hat, is the observance, which I don't believe it to be the most effective, and I'm saying that for the record, and maybe I shouldn't, but is the observance of the holidays. So I think that there should be acknowledgement of that, and I think that is a wonderful way to highlight those, but it should not be the only way and the only time that you acknowledge differences, that should be something that's done throughout the year, which is why we built it in as part of, of the contractual obligations. Uh, but it is a, a time to celebrate the art, the differences, the dance of a, of a, particular, of a particular group. Um, we are also offering language classes for uh, ESL uh, classes for the non-English speaker, and all of those things have evolved with time. In terms of the LGBTQ a plus community, uh, I think I forgot the I. That's okay. um, IA. IA. Um, thank you for uh, the, the, the correction. Um, in terms of, of, of the community, one of the things that we've done is we've established five centers throughout the city, but we've also included training. And one of the things, you know, that was spurred by the one of the hearings we had maybe a few months ago, I think, was to, to encourage again and resurface the training, the, C, the um, SAGE care training. And although I can't make it mandatory, uh, I've been informed, I am strongly encouraging everyone to participate, and so much so that SAGE did a presentation to our providers, uh, talking about the training, the benefits of the training, and encouraging people to participate. So we have a plan for the next two years on how we're gonna develop that training and ensure that every older adult um, club participates in that and so those are those are the ways we address that in terms of the older adult participation and decision-making process every older adult club is mandated to have an advisory council and that advisory council is made of obviously of participants in the program that advisory council also helps inform and educate and shape the programming and frankly I believe that they also help him shape some of the nutrition, the food service program, all right? Okay, and then just um, lastly, what's the budget for that programming, for all the culturally responsive and, and competent programming? Well, it's, it's, it's the entire budget that we have for OACs, which I can get you so that no, number. So nothing specifically designated for no. culture? No, because if it's part of your contract to do it, if, I, if we segregate it out, then that would be what you would do. The, the idea is to make sure that, that all of out. your programming is all inclusive. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, all right, I'm just gonna ask a couple more questions. Um, 
we, and then I'm going to jump to my colleagues. We um, touched on this earlier, the uh, voluntary contributions that you mentioned. Uh -huh. yeah. So clients made $1.3 million in those voluntary contributions to DIFTA's free home delivered me meals program in 2020 and 1.5 million in 2018 and 2019 per the state comptroller's recent audit. And while DIFTA contracted case manager social workers, um, okay, sorry, we said that. Uh, so I just wanna find out altogether, how much money does DIFTA collect from voluntary or suggested contributions or fees? Um, and how much do DIFTA contracted organizations collect? What other services or programs does DIFTA or its contracted partners collect fees or voluntary or suggested contributions for? And then how is the collected money then spent by DIFTA? Okay, the money goes right back. I, I'll get you the full amount of okay. volunteer uh, contributions because we do track that, right? And we track that by program. And we track that by service so that we can have a clear accounting of that. Um, the other thing that's important to let you know is that that, pro that money goes right back to the agency for, for programming. You know, it's not doesn't come back to DIFTA, it doesn't, you know, nor does it reduce the budget. In practice in the past was that if you raise $100, your budget was reduced by $100. This is additive to the contract. Um, and so that, so we can give you an actual amount by pro, I can give you an aggregate and then I can disaggregate it by pro. Okay, for that would be great. All right. Thank you. Um, I want to pause just for a second and allow my colleagues an opportunity to ask some questions. And just as a reminder, um, council members have five minutes for questions and answers. So council member Shulman. Thank you very much, Chair, um, for this important hearing. And uh, good morning, Commissioner. Good morning. So, um, a few things. One, I just want to mention very quickly is that uh, the LGBTQIA um, uh, Older Adult uh, Center in Jackson Heights was at the press conference we had this morning. They came up to me and said that DIFTA has been extraordinarily responsive to them. So I want to thank, thank you. you for that. And I thank you and your staff for that. Um, so I have some questions. One. By the way, you should, I mean, I'm sure you have, but that is a fabulous facility you know, that they're in, so. Uh, so um, one is the cabinet for older New Yorkers. You said you would share the list with us of who's on that, right? The agencies. Right? Yeah, the agencies. Um, what I wanted to ask, um, I don't know if the DA offices are on that because they deal with a lot of elder scams. And I know we've, in Queens, we work with the DA's office on making sure that um, older adults know about those things. I just, I wanted to mention that. Um, the, Do you want an answer to that right now? Are they on? Yeah, are they are they part of the? No, they're not. Oh, okay. But but they are part. Of, they're not because they're not city agencies. So right. that's you know. But what? So that's a okay. real clear distinction. This is about city government right. being responsive and age inclusive. The but what I can tell you is that in our elder justice program, we have monthly meetings. Um, with NYPD and the DAs and everybody else. And that's where their input um, has been very instrumental to us, particularly, you know, it was, it was how we got a crime against the L, uh, uh, older person uh, raised to an, a felony. And it was through that work and that relationship. No, thank you, I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, so here's a question that I have about the cabinet. Um, you say here that it's basically to um, eliminate age-related barriers, um, how agencies can work together for older adults and all of that. In light of the fact that we're facing uh, the possibility of a great deal of um, budget deficits in the coming years, will that be part of the conversation to make sure that the programs and services that we have, that there's some efficiency of scale and that a planning in term, in, in relation to the potential to have budget deficits that affect older adults? I, I believe that we will be very mindful and respectful of each other's limited uh, co financial capacity. Uh, but our work continues, as, as the mayor says, you know, we are, you know, we are faced, we're going to be facing maybe austere times, but at the same time, our work continues. And the work of this is to make sure 
that we do not have barriers to services. And so I don't know that all of those have a cost uh, associated with it. Thank you. Um, I'm going to ask some health, since I'm chair of the health committee, I wanted to ask some health-related questions. So we have, now we have a new booster shot from through COVID. We have flu season. Um, it supposedly, um, the predictions are that it's going to be a bad flu season. So what is DIFTA doing to ensure that our older adults, A, know about what they're eligible for and how they can receive those and who are you working with to make sure that information gets out there? So we have a very strong relationship with the Department of Health, as you know. We were very, very intimately involved with the Department of Health in the vaccine rollout during the early, very difficult, challenging stages, all through its successful uh, work to make sure that tree neighborhoods were uh, were addressed at the same level as everybody else and that was really important to us um so that work will continue you know in terms of this booster shot um we are currently working around getting people boosted with the regular booster shot not the new booster shot so that is all part of our constant information and as i said earlier it's it's aging connect as well as the entire network of aging services, all of us will be a cacophony of sound around the importance of that. Um, and we have not stopped that drumbeat, you know, since first getting vaccinated to then not getting your boosters. I do not think the, the pattern of behavior will change. If anything, I think it'll be amplified. So is there any plan to do any advertising? Because, for example, somebody like me, I don't know what I'm, what I'm supposed to get, how what I'm supposed to get it. There isn't anything in terms of, like, some advertising that's out there or anything else. I know you're doing it individually with older adult centers and all that, and just I just want to know if there's going to be any kind of we ad are, campaign. We have, an, we have a vaccine campaign and we will continue that vaccine public service announcements and educate but they're educational and outreach they're not education as to and giving you information as to the three vaccines and all of that no got that right but it is about the importance of vaccination and you know where and what makes you eligible for it okay and just um just a, one last thing is that um i'm gonna ask if you can partner with dohmh around that piece of it along with where people can actually get the vaccines absolutely and because i think that's really important i know dohmh wants to do that because what we don't want is a season where people are sick and then we have the issue in terms of hospitals and all yeah. of that so yeah that's a common goal that we both have and a common interest okay right. thank you very much thank you Thank you, Councilmember Schulman, and I'll allow uh, Councilmember Richardson Jordan to ask some questions as well. Hi. Hi. So I I know you touched on it already because they are part of the um, cabinet, but uh, what is the connection like with HPD and what sort of um, collaborations are happening uh, around older adults and housing and that? connection between DIFTA and HPD? Yeah, we have, we've had a long relationship with HPD around, around affordability, around design, you know, around the original plan for the 30,000 uh, affordable housing units. And so it's, it's working with them, monitoring that. The other relationship that we have with HPD is as new developers are coming in, you know, and they have an interest in, 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 um, in housing for older adults, like what would that require? What would be some of the social supports that they would need in that particular community? Uh, asking them to make sure that they build it in rather than build and then expect us to pay for it. You know, it's like build it in. Um, and, and it's that kind of relationship that we have with HBD on, uh, on an ongoing basis. Um, I think that one of the other things that we have a very good relationship with HPD around, it's, um, it is current housing stock that the city owns and, and you know, how we're making that more accessible um, 
for older adults because the goal is to keep older adults in the community as the chair talked earlier in her opening remarks it's about staying in place um, and culturally we're not accustomed to you know you know other approaches it's it's about staying in place and staying in your community are, are there meetings outside of the cabinet oh and no these were like all regularly? pre-cabinet so oh, we expect okay. this to accelerate and you know to go even deeper with the cabinet these are all relationships and projects that we work on all pre the existence of the cabinet it was that that launched us to say you know we need something more and okay. more structured going on you know and do you have any data uh, in in terms of the older adult centers or the social clubs as to how often seniors are requesting support um, around housing? We have some of that data. We do have that data. Um, this is just something I'm, I'm personally interested in. We did a listening tour after I was elected. We did a District 9 listening tour. And for the older adults, the number one thing was technology and learning how to use technology. Uh, but the number two thing was housing security. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we can. I can get you the number um, of 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 what we've done. I can tell you how many people ask for assistance in our uh, support service uh, around evictions, um, and I can I can get you those kind of, of of discrete numbers in terms of housing assistance requests. All right. Okay. Great. Thank you. But yeah, housing is is one of the most pressing issues for many New Yorkers, including older adults. Um, actually, and uh, sorry, one more. Uh, and then do you know how much, it, it may be hard to know offhand, but how much budget-wise is going towards the casework, um, the casework piece? I will get you, I will get you the number of, of the budget. Remember that we don't handle, in the eviction conversation, we handle all the social services of people who are already in eviction proceeding, all right? The legal services and all of that is handled by our sister agency at HRA. And we, again, have a very good, seamless relationship uh, around the legal side. So, but I can get you how much we uh, support for the social service for that. that, all right? Okay, thank right. you. Thank you, council member. Um, since we're on housing, I would like to continue in that line of questioning. Um, does DIFTA track the housing status of older adults in New York City, um, including the rate of homelessness among older New Yorkers, older adult home ownership? How many older adults in New York City face the threat of eviction or termination of tenancy over the past five years? So it's one of those, the issue, one of the questions, series of questions that we ask that older adults as part of our star system, that it's a voluntary question. And so to the extent that we have it, it is on a volunteer uh, basis. Um, but nonetheless, we know that housing, you know, including physical supports and uh, stability remain, you know, one of the most pressing issues. But I can give, get you what the numbers show now in terms of voluntary information that we have. Okay, um, that would be helpful. But just in, in terms of, I guess, general like research that the agency does, you don't have access to any of those statistics. You know what, to be honest with you, uh, Chair Hudson, I believe that we may, and I can get you what okay. we do have, all right? Okay. But I don't have it with me right now. Okay, thank you. Um, you don't know in terms of evictions though we can get that oh. from our sister agency also i can get you that okay and what about the response rate to the volunteered the the voluntary information yes that's what i was saying earlier i can get okay, okay. all right all right um what type of case management services are offered to older adults in need of housing support? I know you mentioned case management once they're already in proceedings. Right. So, um, is there any so, other type so of there's, support So providers? there's that, which is the, um, the eviction uh, support services, right? Um, and, and it's called TSS, Tenant Eviction Support Services. Um, the other way that we do is access information around scree and DRE, all right? Um, so, and that comes from 
Aging Connect, but that also comes from every older adult program, you know, can facilitate and access that um, or have access to that for older adults. Um, and those are the ways that, you know, in our outreach efforts that we provide information on housing. Okay. Um, can you describe any work DIFTA does with the New York City Department of Housing Preservation and Development, or HPD, um, as Councilmember Richardson Jordan uh, mentioned, to address affordable housing and tenant protection issues that impact older New Yorkers? Uh, with the tenant protection is working with HRA very closely. On, on some of those uh, services. Um, and, you know, whether it's that one-time availability to give you some money, um, and it's things of that nature. Uh, with the HPD, as I alluded to, there are many projects that we work with with HPD on uh, in terms of housing security or housing uh, physical ability, you know, physical shape, but we will, look at ways and also with the housing plan that we have and with new developers and so all of that work continues with HPD um, and we'll see what we can come up with in terms of we have a vision of of what we would like to uh, ensure when we look at the, the housing czar you know we were very instrumental in giving an entire outline of what was needed for older adults as part of the housing czar's housing plan and so that that's the way we continue those kind of conversations and input and also try to influence the policies in the direction okay um according to a march 7th 2022 community service society study of new york city office of civil justice data on who uses right to counsel services the share of tenants above the 200% federal poverty line income restriction served by the program increased from 8 to 14% between July 2018 and June 30th, 2020. Do you know what share of those tenants were older adults? I can get you that. Um, but I can tell you that, you know, like older adults, like all others, are dealing with the same challenges. Um, and the same rent challenges, you know, as as all of our other uh, residents. But, you know, we continue to work with our agencies uh, to make sure that we we address the older adults' housing needs to the extent possible and to the availability of housing. Does does DIFTA engage with the New York City Department of Investigation and or the city court system in the carrying out of eviction or foreclosure proceedings against older adult tenants? What we do is we work with HPD and HRA on those kind of issues, not with DOI. But in carrying out eviction or foreclosure proceedings? With, with. Um, or preventing. You, you said well, you, well, work, the, you work with them in the, pro, once they're already in proceedings. Right. For eviction, so you're providing services and aiding them? In terms of prevention. Um, the program that we have is you have to be in an eviction state uh, before in we order can to provide qualify. services. Okay. Right? Um, that is not to say that through all of the advocacy and the case management agencies, there is not prevention work being done. Okay. I want to I make clear that distinction. Do you think it would be possible for DIFTA to provide resources to prevent eviction or foreclosure proceedings? I think that we would we would work closely with our assigned counsel program at HRA to make sure that the aging services and the aging needs are looked at in terms of prevention. Okay, and you just preempted my next question, okay. <laughs> which was to describe the assigned counsel project. So the Please. assigned project offers legal assistance, you know, to to individuals citywide. And due to staffing, you know, um, DIFTA's supports are limited to Brooklyn and Manhattan. Uh, these have been the highest uh, areas with, uh, with the greatest needs. And then we continue ways to, to expand other, to other boroughs. Uh, but legal services are offered also through our referrals through the Department for the Aging's contracted legal services in each of the boroughs. Thank you. And where can older adults access ACP? What options 
do older adults in Staten Island have? Uh, it's a joint program between HRA, OCJ, Department for the Aging. Uh, the HRA provides the legal services, as, as I said earlier, and DIFTA provides the social services and case assistance. As of last year, the program served roughly, and that's the social service piece, 415 clients in a year. You know, the needs always outpace the demand, and we're proud to be able to assist older adults through this program. Um, it's labor intensive and very costly to operate. Um, and so the, and the legal services does not have a social service component. So we're kind of like always looking at, um, at that relationship. But I can say that the assigned uh, council program has a 95 uh, success rate in um, preventing evictions. And that is a tribute to that program uh, because they focus primarily on the eviction piece. And that's why they have such a high success rate. So um, we continue to partnership uh, with uh, HRA on that. Okay, so you mentioned 415 clients a year. Do you have um, a number for how many older adults were served by ACP over the past five years and how many were turned away? No, we due do to not. capacity. I can get you that information. Okay, and um, is ACP uh, available to older adults in Staten Island? ACP is a citywide operation, so I would have to assume uh, that it has opera services in Staten Island, and the Department for the Aging also has legal services that serve the borough of, of Staten Island. Okay, and approximately how many attorneys, social workers, and social work interns work with the assigned council project? And yeah, I can get you that. I have. Okay. I ha I, that's an HRA program. I don't have that uh, information. And at what rate is ACP funded? Feder federally uh, from the state? The assigned the council project is funded uh, primarily with tax levy dollars. I believe it started as a council initiative, if I'm not mistaken. We can look into the record for that, but I believe it was. Okay. And are you aware of any programs that provide public assistance to pay rent arrears specifically for older adults? Uh, yes. Uh, the uh, HRA has an emergency rental assistance program, um, and then it also has a one-time shot deal, you know, to help people financially. So those, those are available to everyone, but there's no specific program for older adults. That is an age-inclusive program, so right. we can get HRA to probably disaggregate that by age, and we can get you that information. That'd be helpful. I'll, I'm sure that they have it by age. Okay. And if not, we can we can do a, a okay. estimate based on population. Okay. Yeah, that would be helpful because we're also trying to figure out if there are any older adult populations that are not currently covered by one-shot deal eligibility or other forms of rental arrears assistance, um, which is essentially what we're trying to do with this legislation is to ensure that all older adults, regardless of um, income level, have access to um, support and resources. I'll see what the specifications are and get back to you on that. Okay. And do you have any specific feedback on the pre-considered intro introductions? Um, well, the so I can address two of them Okay. Uh, for you. Um, one is the Bill of Rights one. Mm -hmm. uh, we do have a Bill of Rights. We have a pretty robust Bill of Rights. Um, that is mandated to be posted at every center, and it's one of the standards. Um, um, so funny, I was gonna uh, show it to you. Um, but, um, and, and it's pretty inclusive. Yeah. You know, some of the language probably needs to be updated, you know, because it has broad language like sexual harassment, mm -hmm. orientation, and, you know, so it, it probably needs to be more specific, mm -hmm. but it is very, very robust in terms of, um, of letting older adults know what their rights are. Right? I think what we're trying to solve for with this piece of legislation is the fact that 
that Bill of Rights is posted in places that not every older adult may be, you know, That's visiting or seeing. And so with a, with a Know Your Rights pamphlet or, you know, package of information that's actually sent out to folks, shared with folks through other agencies, um, it's a, you know, a means to reach every older adult rather than just the ones that might be attending older adult clubs. And that's a point well taken. Um, so that um, we agree with you conceptually in terms of let's get it out to as many people as possible. And uh, we have a very... You, as you know, a very rich uh, pamphlet, and how to make sure that, and to make sure that we include that as part of our pamphlet. So conceptually you agree, but in practice, is, is there a caveat or no? In practice, we will obviously keep working with you to make sure that this gets known and widely see as, as extensively as we possibly can. Okay. I think, I think, uh, I believe, you know, so conceptually, yes, absolutely. I think some of the reporting uh, requirements is one of the things that I think we should have a continuous conversation because of the labor-intensive nature of some of those reporting requirements. And so we would love to continue that conversation with you. Okay. Happy to, to continue that conversation. Yeah. And then the other one was on cultural competency, yes. I believe. And cultural competency, it's part of our standards now. And so um, we would continue to work with you to make sure that that is as extensive but it is it is so ingrained in who we are and where we're going you know and and you've heard some of the pushback because of our desire to move it further uh, in terms of cultural competency and the goal eventually is to make sure that as all of the council members got a map of where their services are and we also mapped where the service deserts exist mm -hmm. and to make sure that we have services in tree communities. That is our goal. Our goal is to go there and event and the ultimate, you know, and the long term goal is to have equity and inclusion as to who the service providers are also. So those are the kind of things that we're m moving towards. But uh, cultural competency, a commitment to equity and inclusion is part of our DNA. And um, and we continue to work with you on how to make sure that that's structured and uh, how that's monitored and um, and where the gaps exist. Okay. Yeah, I think I think some of the concerns, at least that I have, are just, you know, as we've all noted, the increase in population that we're going to experience over the next, you know, several years and just making sure that we're all prepared to handle that and that we have the programming and the resources. I know, you know, it's part of the contracts now, but those uh, diverse populations will only increase. Right. Um, so. And so one of the things I will say for you I, on the record is that it's part of the contract and what we need to do is also address the culture, right? Because you know, uh, culture will eat strategy for lunch every day. Right. So um, we need to really introduce a culture of inclusion and diversity in almost everything that we do. Mm -hmm. And um, our contractors have to know that that is a good thing and that we're moving forward with that. And I think that we're moving in that direction. And I'm pleased to say that there is a recognition that this growing population has to be addressed. And status quo is not going to be able to help us address that glow, growing diverse population so that we all have to adapt and change and learn new things. And that's where we're moving. Absolutely, thank you. Um, just bear with me one second. Okay, um, we're just barely coming out of the summer. Um, and so I just wanna ask a few questions around summer heat relief. The city's emergency cooling centers, which are primarily located in community and older adult centers, public libraries and NYCHA facilities are not located equitably across neighborhoods. What is the city doing to address this inequity? You know, the Department for the Aging is a strong part. I can almost do that one by, by my head, but I don't want to say things out of school. Um, the um, Department for the Aging is uh, is a strong partner with the 
Office of Emergency Management. Our Office of Emergency Management is the one that dictates when we have a uh, um, heat emergency, and they are also the ones that, and we are there to support them. Again, when I first came to the department, one of the things we had, I was in the department maybe a week, and we had a heat emergency, and it was a arduous task to get cooling centers up and operating. And one of the things that we did, and it was mostly because people said it wasn't contractually obligated, and one of the things that we did in the subsequent RFP, uh, which followed that fall, was to make it part of the contract. So every older adult club is uh, a required to be a cooling center. Uh, so we had about 180 of them opened this year. And so um, and during all of the heat emergencies that, that occurred. And um, several of them, you know, operated uh, for 13 days this summer in terms of heat emergencies. And two of those days included additional hours um, than the program normally operates. And uh, we were able to serve about 1,000 50, I mean, 154,248 individuals. So, um, and some of the programs even. I'm sorry, can you meals. repeat that number? Sure. 154,248 total attendance Thank you. for those days uh, at cooling centers. And remember that most of them were operating um, during uh, regular work hours and uh, regular open, uh, service hours. In addition, we had some weekend services, and the the only limitation we have for weekend services at uh, cooling centers is obviously for religious service. So you could either take Saturday or Sunday off, but you have to be open one of those if one of those days is designated. Is that heater. only in communities um, that ha you know that have a population that? No, this is cooling centers. Everywhere. The department for the aging cooling center. So one of the, um, some feedback that we've received from advocates um, is that the, the centers that are open on the weekends have far more people visiting because obviously a lot more people are home during the weekends maybe um, and need those, those services, but not all cooling centers seem to be open during the weekend. So are you saying that all DIFTA cooling centers or all OAC cooling centers are open every weekend at least one day? No. I just want to make sure I'm following. Okay. So what I'm saying is that all centers, if, if the emergency is on a weekend, have to be responsive. The caveat or the distinction where they cannot, will they would, would not be one, is if there's landlord or physical space restrictions that Based don't on. allow them to open. That's one. The other is if there's religious observance. Right. If it happens to be on a weekend, you know, but we say that you can take one of the days for religious observance. You can't do both, both days okay. for religious observance. So those are the things that will re prevent a center from being open on a weekend. Of course, they're, you know, the universe conspires and there might be, you know, an HVAC issue that happens on that particular weekend. but. By and large, it's a contractual obligation that they're open in the hours that OEM d determines at, that are heat hours, heat periods. Okay. And you mentioned that for two days out of the 13 days that these cooling centers were operated, they were open for two additional hours. Um, for there, extended hours. Right. There's a report from August 4th of this year by the city comptroller um, that says that hundreds of emergency cooling centers were closed for two days during July's heat wave. Half of the facilities listed in the city's cooling center finder were listed as closed on Saturday, which I'm sure probably is attributed to uh, what you were just talking about. But while more than 80% were closed on Sundays, um, nearly half of the city's activated cooling centers were OACs for New Yorkers aged 60 plus. Of those cooling centers, nearly 60% did not offer extended hours, and 22% were not wheelchair accessible. What were the rates of cooling center utilization during this time? 
um, among I can give you a chart by day of the hours and the attendance of each one of those okay, days. Okay, great. The other thing I want to, before the record, is that every center is wheelchair accessible. And I, we, as we operate as an older adult club during the, the week or in non-heat emergencies. And so being uh, wheelchair or handicap accessible is a requirement. Okay, well, I'm just sharing what the what the city comptroller found. Um, do you have any? I, 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 yeah. Go ahead. Um, I was just told that report is about the entire network, not only DIFTA. All right. Right. Okay. And we represent half of uh, of probably those cooling centers. Thank you for that. Yeah. Um, can you provide any metrics that show the impact that um, being closed for two of the days during the July heat wave had on older New Yorkers? And do you know what DIFTA has done to be better prepared for another potential heat wave this year? I mean, obviously, you know, as we experience climate change, it's getting hotter and hotter. Um, so I'm, I, with all due respect, um, we are prepared for heat emergencies. We're well prepared for heat emergencies. Um, and unless there is a mitigating circumstance, I would say that our, our providers are extremely responsive. So I can give you all of the details as to what days programs were open, which one of those was heat emergency day. I mean, all of the heat emergency days and what was the census for each one of those. Okay, okay. great. And then specifically, I'm also interested in uh, older New Yorkers who live in East Flatbush which only had two open cooling centers available to its 162,400 residents, for example. Um, and so I'm just curious to know about heat relief. I understand that you don't operate all of the cooling centers, but I'm concerned with the older adults who need access to those cooling centers. And so I think, you know, it should be a, a mutual interest um, that the older older New Yorkers, wherever they may be, Absolutely. whether it's a OAC, DIFTA provided cooling center or not, that all of those cooling centers are accessible to older New Yorks, New Yorkers, excuse me. And that's that's a totally appropriate expectation. Mm -hmm. um, for the flat for the flat bush, the East Flat Bush area, mm -hmm. we can look at who are the designated cooling centers in that area. Yeah, and I can. Uh, identify those that are older adult clubs. Uh, don't forget, we do it by community districts, so the lines might be a little different. Yep. Um, but we can provide that information for you, and we can also work with OEM to see what other services they have in that community. Yeah, I mean, Br Brooklyn has the largest number of older adults in the city, and so to know that in East Flatbush, there are only two cooling centers for over 150,000 residents, you know, is concerning. And it's also concerning that some of those cooling centers, although they may not be DIFTA operated, were not accessible to older adults. Yeah. Um, you know, for anybody who might be experiencing mobility impairment, so. Point noted. Do you, do you coordinate, does DIFTA coordinate with non-DIFTA cooling centers at all? Uh, we collaborate with OEM, but we do not, you know, coordinate with uh, non-DIFTA cooling centers in the middle of a heat emergency. We focus on the older adult clubs that serve as cooling centers and make sure that they have the support and the supplies that they may need for that period and the uh, staffing uh, requirements for that, for those heat emergencies. Okay. That's where our focus is. Okay. Um, I just want to share this. Does OEM oversee all of the cooling centers? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, heat mortality rates are twice as high among black New Yorkers as compared to white New Yorkers. And average annual rates of heat stress are nine times higher for New Yorkers in their 70s and 16 times higher for those over 80 compared to younger people under 20 years old. While DOHMH is required to report on heat mortality rates, including among older adults. Uh, does DIFTA do any work related to the impact of heat on older New Yorkers specifically? And is any of that disaggregated by race and ethnicity? Um, we do not look at the mortality rates. Um, I do not believe that we collect that data. 
But what we do do is with every older adult club, they have the what we call the coop plan. Um, the cool plan? Coop. Coop. Oh, coop. Yeah, it's a uh, an emergency preparedness uh, plan. And in that plan, it is also how to distribute information to older adults during um, during these emergencies. Heat being one of them. Okay, so are you aware of any any work that the city is doing to address the disparity, specifically in heat mortality rates? I believe that the establishment of cooling centers is, is one of those uh, directions to prevent um, to prevent it. And um, I also believe that um, the public education part of it, and the city uh, had distributed 80,000 air conditioners uh, in previous years to uh, ensure that particularly in low income um, in tree neighborhoods to ensure that we could get as many people as possible their own air conditioning system. So I think that there have been steps taken in that direction. Um, and I believe that, you know, it's something that is, we're very mindful of. How many cooling activation days has the city budgeted for this year? We activated, uh, you operated, you said, for 13. We operated for 13. In the budget, we've also we've usually used the year before as a, as a standard. Mm. So we had 15 days uh, budgeted. Um, but that being said, it's, you know, within your own, the program's budget, you know, requirements are there, you know. But we usually use the year before as experienced uh, to budget the subsequent years. But you're right, you, you know, that's why we have 15 and we've only experienced 13 so far. Mm -hmm. so. But we are aware of these severe climate change. Well, and that's perfect because I was just gonna ask, how is the, that number expected to be impacted by climate change over the next 10 years? Uh, are, you, that, are you forecasting? Uh, we're look, we always, we, that's what we do with OEM. And that is what our emergency preparedness always looks at. Not only um, that, but also hurricanes and flooding and rains and things of that nature. So yeah, we're looking at that very seriously. And then what happens if there are more heat wave days than, than you budgeted for? We deal with that constraint at the time. Okay. Um, all right, jumping to health and mental health and social isolation. 32% of older New Yorkers live alone and lack family or a similar support system, which has been associated with increased risk of mortality and cognitive decline. What efforts does the city make to ensure the well-being of older adults who live alone? Well, I'm pleased to say that we have been very fortunate that we have been able to expand our 40 geriatric mental health programs to 88 this year uh, with the additional funds. We're in that process right now. And the focus is on uh, tree communities who have been the most impacted by COVID. And, and we're also looking at ways to um, expand, you know, we expanded Friendly Visiting, um, and now we have a program called Friendly Voices, which is our expand the number of ways that we can connect with older adults um, who are isolated. We are very concerned, as I said earlier, one of the issues that we want to address collectively and uh, hopefully all of us, advocates, council, and Department for the Aging, as well as all of the contractors is this uh, concern that we have about the low participation rates at older adult clubs. I mean, people are thinking about it from, there's one sector that thinks about it from a funding perspective. Uh, there's other sectors uh, that are thinking about it from the long-term implications of social isolation. And um, so that it, it is an issue that has that is fraught with many, many uh, concerns. And we have to address that all jointly. Thank you. Uh, 
Okay, DIFTA runs two volunteer programs in partnership with the Mayor's Office of uh, Community Mental Health, which are designed to build friendships and limit social isolation. What kind of advertising or outreach does the city conduct with regard to friendly visiting and friendly voices? Uh, we, again, through our whole network of services is how we ex you know, let people know about these programs. Our CMA agencies, our case management agencies are instrumental in the friendly visiting conversation as well as some of our home delivered meals providers, all right? And we also have what we have established long, many, many years ago at older adult clubs called telephone reassurance, you know, which is something that we've turned into friendly voices and expanded, but it's been a long tradition to connect with uh, fellow members who are for some reason absent from a center. So it's something that we continuously do uh, and everyone is part of that outreach conversation. Um, and that is something that, you know, uh, continues particular in this interminable post-COVID existence. Oh, sorry. You don't have any uh, numbers, do you, on, on the volunteers and older adults that participate in those programs? Oh, yeah. We have that. I can get okay. that for you. Thank you. I can, I can get you telephone reassurance, friendly visiting, and friendly voices. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, according to DIFTA's website, due to the pandemic, as you mentioned, volunteers with the Friendly Visiting Program are currently maintaining social distancing guidelines and are connecting with their matches by phone and video calls. Do you know the timeline for reinstituting in-person visits? We're, we're doing that case by case. Okay. And remember, you know, in all of this conversation is that the older adult have, has choice in the matter, and we have to honor the older adult's choice um, of how they prefer to continue those visits. And relationship. What kind of assistance does DIFTA offer older adults who may require some technical assistance in order to participate in video calls and or virtual groups? Yeah, that we continue. I mean, I think when I think of highlights during COVID, I think of the advancements that the network has done in terms of virtual programming, virtual training, and how we've incorporated that into uh, a way of being. And I don't think we'll ever go back from that, not only of its ingenuity, but also because of the kind of access and additional services that it provides. So it's something that we continue and we will work with the end. The other thing is, we keep working with the advocates and everyone and anyone to make sure that the affordable connectivity project is well known because I may know how to use the service, but if it's unaffordable to me, if it's, you know, if it's out of my cost range, then it doesn't matter. And so the f affordable uh, connectivity project is something that we all need to keep beating that drumbeat to make sure that everybody applies. So we count on the advocates in our network to, to elevate that, the need for that. Thank you. Um, I wanna jump to home delivered meals and, and then we'll get into some of the public testimony. Um, at what rate does DIFTA fund home delivered meals annually and over the past five years? I can tell you that in two seconds, just give me a. Okay, um, it's funded for $60 million for FY23, and this includes the additional $2.3 million that was awarded in FY22, and the $9.4 million in FY23 mm -hmm. to raise the reimbursement rate for home delivered meals. Um, this uh, home delivered meals program, you know, as you all well, no, it has very specific criteria for who is eligible and thought that criteria is regulated by the state. So it's a growing program. We know that uh, COVID will 
has had an impact on that program. Right. And we anticipate, I don't want to get ahead of myself. I'm sure you have questions, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. I'm like, do go on. <laughs> <laughs> and, and we anticipate there, you know, it's gonna, the d demand that we've already seen is about 3,000 3, and we're getting the case management agencies to work on that. And now it's also ensuring that we have the capacity within our home delivered meals to continue to provide that service. So it's and, this. and that was exactly my question is how many older New Yorkers take advantage of the program compared to demand? Oh, the 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 de right now we are at about twenty two thousand a day, right? Um, and we anticipate that increasing by about three thousand. Um, and we're trying to also calibrate that with the capacity at the Home Delivered Meals Program. And so it's a constant um, review and use, use of resources to meet both those demands, right? Do you have that data disaggregated by zip code? Not by zip code, but we probably have it by borough. No, you know what? That's not true. We do have it by zip code because of the 20 Home Delivered Meals sites that we have, which are really consolidated into 14 contracts, mm -hmm. um, we have that information. Okay. So I can get that too. Great. That would be wonderful. Thank you. Um, and I th think maybe you just answered this. How many different community-based organizations does DIFTA currently contract with to deliver meals anyways? Is that 14? We have 14 contracts, but there are 20 sites because during the RFP, uh, a lot of them consolidated their budgets. but. So it's contracts are less than okay. actual sites. Oh, I, I uh, okay. According to a January 2022 audit of the home delivery meals program by the state comptroller, there have been repeated problems with food safety and nutrition, inadequate complaint response, and contracts awarded despite perfor poor performance. Excuse me. Um, so I'm wondering what options does DIFTA have in terms of not awarding contracts to repeat offenders? So with all due respect to the state controller, who is a dear friend of mine, that audit was used, that finding, based on one organization. And, um, and the is that one organization still providing services? Yes, it is. And I'll tell you why. Okay. Because... Our goal and many of the recommendations we agreed to with the audit findings that we have we had already put in place, but you know the audit comes and the audit does a past year. But our approach has been with that agency is to, to provide the technical assistance and remediation rather than terminating contracts. A lot of our programs are in in physical locations uh, where the complexities of the facility exacerbate some of these programs and we have to work towards mitigation. Um, in, there is no way that we would not terminate a program that was a severely neglecting its obligation. However, if there's circumstances that we can work towards mitigating, the goal is to mitigate those and continue working with that provider. Um, the state audit saw it quite differently and uh, we're working to balance uh, those differences and looking at some of our monitoring, escalating when we find some problems. But I do not believe, uh, we do not believe that termination is the only, uh, is the, the, the only recourse, the only, only point of view, right? I, I understand. I guess when, when I think about issues that have been flagged, which here it's referencing food safety and cleanliness, including roaches or vermin in kitchen and food, not protected against contamination, nutrition issues, including high sodium level levels, and the failure to submit Department of Health inspection reports within 24 hours. If that was happening in our school system, it, it, people would be outraged. But the fact that it's happening to older adults, perhaps not as many people are outraged. That's not, I, I, I don't agree with that statement well, at all. I, I'm not, this is not a, a, a an indictment on you and the agency. I'm saying culturally, right? Oh, yeah. Like overall, no, no. if but something like that have, was happening in schools, absolutely. people aren't even really paying attention, quite frankly, to what's happening in older adult centers. So I just want to make sure that whatever recourse and re remediation is being done is actually 
right. you know, effective. So I want to address that two points. Whether it's an indictment on me or not, it is ultimately my responsibility because I'm sitting in the chair, all right? Um, so thank you for saying it's not an indictment on me, but I'm responsible because I'm sitting in the chair. And we have to make some decisions. There is no way that we have a robust nutrition team of incredibly talented nutritionists uh, who review these programs and who cite programs all the time. As a matter of fact, just a month and a half ago, we had a meeting with all of our providers about uh, so many of them are going to get poor performance evaluations this year because of the relationship uh, with the caterers, that the caterers are not in compliance, and that reflects on the program. Right. And so those conversations are constantly had. The health and safety of older adults uh, and the nutritional standards of old adults is our utmost responsibility. That being said, if a program is facing severe challenges because of their physical space, we have three alternatives. Keep working with them to mitigate those or relocate them. But all of that takes time. Closing them is not the only thing that we should do. Um, and that is of great importance. But if it's someone is in violation, we have no problem shutting them and coming up with another plan of how do we continue those services that, they, that they're providing because that's, that's the, the balancing of the competing demands, all right? Um, but one of the things is that, you know, we have the Department of Health who does inspections of our sites and we have our nutritionists who do inspections of our sites. And what we've built in now with our nutritionists is a, a process of escalating, uh, one, repeated complaints and, and uh, problems that have become more severe. And then, and then coming up with strategies and mitigations for each one of those levels. Okay. All right. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, how many complaints about meal quality and delivery is DIFTA currently handling? And do you know the median resolution rate? Yeah, we can give you that. I don't have that with me. Okay. Do you have a sense of, like, the, the most common types of complaints regarding home delivery Well, meals? for home delivered meals, it's usually late <laughs> delivery um, uh, or... That's usually the most common complaint. Okay. Um, you know, no, we no longer have that many complaints around food and food quality because older adults now have choice in the kind of foods that they're asking for. And, um, and they're also, many of them are, are either chilled or frozen, depending on whether the older adult has ability uh, to, to, re, to heat food so that they can have choice when they eat that food. And um, do you have any policies in place to determine if meals were actually delivered to clients directly? Yes. We have developed, uh, one, we have a very extensive tracking system. Uh, between Each program has to have a very, very ex uh, extensive tracking system as to when meals are delivered. And, and that has been very effective. Uh, lately, we have we're pilot testing an app where the driver actually, and all of this was done in, by paper, which was labor intensive, you know, subject to human error, one of the things that the state controller also cited. Um, but it's, you know, a subject to human error. And so what we've done with pilot testing now an app where the driver can indicate real time when the food was delivered to whom, and then that goes straight to the program, which then goes into the star system. You know, but like technology, it has bumps and blips. Okay, thank you. Um, since 2020, which non-English languages did older New Yorkers use to respond to DIFTA client surveys? Um, the, I don't know. Um, you know, we've we've designed it so that it's in in multiple languages. Mm -hmm. um, can you can you send us then the I sure will the languages right? and uh, and break sure. out the number of client surveys completed by language? That would be yeah, helpful. We'll okay. do that. And one Thank of the you. things you should be aware of, and staff will probably tell me anyway. One of the things that we're doing right now as part of our efficiency stu uh, study, which we're really proud of, is we're looking at creating a system where older adults can give us automatic responses and that we can tabulate that. You know, you know how when you go into um, 
and home delivered meals we are looking at how we would do that and maybe putting it on that delivery app but we also we're looking at something you know when you go to airports or certain places mm -hmm. and you have the three you know happy sad mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so we're looking at maybe not that uh, but looking at some a very simple way of tabulating client uh, satisfaction like in real time in real time is that would that be an app that they have on their own device or is that being being provided by and the those are the things we're work? looking at now okay. what makes more sense do we put it on your device or do we use that barcode that all older adults have mm -hmm. you know who participate in senior centers and use that as a scanning I mean so we're just looking at all of those possibilities but we're looking seriously, uh, and it, this came out of early planning meetings with providers on getting, you know, customer service was an important piece that we've always been missing, real-time customer ser uh, response. Um, so okay. that is, that, that's a, we're working on it, and that's a long time in coming. Okay. Thank you so much. Commissioner, that concludes my questions um, for this morning, and then I'll uh, we'll move on to public testimony. And we will provide you this data as soon as possible. Just um, yes. we'll some of it is ours to collect, but some of it we rely on on our sister agencies. And thank you for that. Understood. Yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, just as a reminder for those. Um, testifying from the public. Everybody will have three minutes. Um, so we'll now begin public testimony with uh, the first panel with Brianna Payton Williams from Live On New York, Kevin Jones from ARP New York, and James Fenton from Volunteers of Legal Service. Uh, and just a, a quick uh, note in, for, in terms of logistics, in-person testimonies will be taken before those on Zoom. You can begin when you're ready. Thank you. Hello, I'm Brianna Peden Williams, the Communications and Policy Associate at Live on New York. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Live on New York's members include more than 110 community based nonprofits that provi provide core services which allow all New Yorkers to thrive in our community as we age. First and foremost, Live on New York is appreciative of city's investments for older adults in the aging sector in the FY22. Uh, 23, excuse me, adopted budget. This budget moves the aging service sector in the right direction from a significant human services workforce investment to additional funding for home delivered meals to keep older adults fed. Nonetheless, we also recognize there is more work to be done to better support older New Yorkers while the aging population continues to be the fasting demo fastest growing demographic with one in five New Yorkers expected to be 60 and older by 2040, the city must go further to ensure all all older New Yorkers, regardless of their background, have access to equitable aging services to safely age in community. Therefore, we invite the city to utilize our aging policy agenda, Aging is Everyone's Business, released by Live on New York, in partnership with Hunter College Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging, which is a bold policy agenda that provides actionable policy solutions to make New York a better place to age. In addition, Live on New York recommends the following. DIFTA should assess and allocate funding for the significant inflation impacts on raw food, gas prices, and other infrastructure needs. Many of Live on New York's members have raised their concerns of the impact inflation cost for raw food, gas prices, and other items. For example, one of our members saw a 40% increase in raw food due to inflation this year alone. The unavoidable financial strain has created challenges for providers to continue to meet their growing capacity for home delivered meals, in addition to providing congregate meals for older adult centers. Nonetheless, Live on New York is appreciative of City Council's recent 
announcement of $3 million in funding for the repair and replacement of hotshot vans for the Home Delivered Meals program. In addition, the city should support new models of service, including home delivered meals. New models of service such as grab and go, um, including grab and go, were critical and unsuccessful in ensuring that who may not be comfortable congregating due to COVID risk or for any personal reasons um, will are less willing to meet their nutritional needs by eating at an older adult center, have the option to take their meal home, a decision that ensures one's nutritional needs can be met in the environment of their own choosing. We also recommend that the city allocates funding to develop a thousand units of affordable senior housing per year. And while the adopted budget included investments to support affordable housing programs, the city must go further to fully address the need for affordable senior housing. In addition, we also recommend the city increases the per unit reimbursement rate for the SARA program from $5,000 per unit to $700 per unit. In addition, Live on New York applauds uh, Aging Chair Hudson for introducing the legislative package that's promoting critical services and supports for all ages in our community. More information can be found in our written testimony and thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you so much. Kevin? Oh, good. Uh, good morning. I'm not used to doing this in person, so <laughs> thanks. Uh, good morning, Chair Hudson and members of the Aging Committee. My name is Kevin Jones, the Associate State Director of Advocacy at AARP New York, which has 750,000 members of the 50-plus community in New York City. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to testify at today's hearing um, on uh, improved access to services for older adults. Older adults represent the fastest growing demographic. The 65 plus age group is growing 12 times faster than the under 65. Given this reality, the city should pay significant attention to the needs of older individuals. New York City must work to eliminate ageism and ensure the dignity and quality of life of its diverse older adult population, particularly when it comes to interacting with their government. And AARP is proud to support Councilmember Hudson's legislative package to ensure more equitable and inclusive access for older New Yorkers in housing, knowing their rights and participating in programming. AARP has long supported and pushed for the availability of affordable housing options to support widely held uh, desire of older New Yorkers to remain in their homes and communities as they age. Many older New Yorkers without family ties with little uh, retirement savings end up isolated in adult homes or forced into the city's homeless shelter system. Uh, the, the projected growth of the aging population and increased demand for city living and a lack of affordable housing for low income, low and middle income uh, aging adults points to a growing need to preserve existing affordable housing. The first bill in Chair uh, Hudson's package would address this by helping seniors avoid unwarranted eviction or termination of tenancy and foreclosure. Without adequate awareness, programs and services to support older New Yorkers can, uh, cannot help the communities they were created to help. Therefore, AARP supports the second bill as well, which would require the creation and maintenance of a Know Your Rights pamphlet for older adults. The pamphlet would not only inform older adults about their rights, but also provide them with information on how to contact relevant agencies and community-based organizations to help them exercise these rights. This bill would require dissemination of these pamphlets as well as public outreach efforts to ensure widespread increased knowledge and usage. Uh, additionally, according to New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, only 44% of the city's 1.1 million older, older adults identify as white, while 22% identify as black, 21% as Latino, 12% as Asian Pacific Islander, and 2% as mixed race ethnicity um, or other. Many older adult New Yorkers rely on older adult centers for programming access to services and most importantly, um, a sense of community and belonging. The third bill would require older adult centers to expand uh, their programming to include linguistic and cultural programs relevant to local communities. AARP promotes livable communities and cultural relevant and inclusive programming is vital to preventing isolation in older adults, um, which uh, as we all know, isolation can cause a lot of other issues. Um, it's equal to smoking, uh, health-wise about smoking 15 cigarettes a day. So our city seniors deserve to age with dignity and to have their rights protected. And these bills go a long way towards achieving that goal. So thank you for having me and I'm happy to answer any questions, but I'll submit a longer version uh, online as well. Sounds good, thank you. Thank you. And um, James Fenton, Volunteers of Legal Service. Thank you for the opportunity to testify this morning. Uh, my name is James Fenton. I'm a senior staff attorney at Volunteers of Legal Service, or VALS. 
Vols was established in 1984, and our purpose is to leverage private attorneys to provide free legal services to low-income New Yorkers to help fill the justice gap. Our senior law project focuses on services helping low-income older New Yorkers plan for their future by obtaining wills and other advanced directives. This planning ultimately allows seniors to make their wishes clear, empower their chosen caregivers, and to allow them to age in place in their community for as long as is feasible. In addition to our life planning services, we operate a legal advice hotline for older New Yorkers, and <clears throat> legal issues related to the fear of eviction and homelessness top the list of questions we receive. While both New York State and New York City have taken significant steps to protect the rights of low-income tenants in recent years, landlords continue to push forward with their efforts to force out long-term tenants in rent-regulated housing, many of whom are older adults. The seniors who we speak to are acutely aware of the lengths their landlords will go to push them out of their apartments and are anxious of the possibility of having to fight for their apartments without the help of an attorney. Many of our clients worry that their mobility issues will prevent them from effectively participating in eviction cases brought against them by their landlords. Our homebound clients only receive mail periodically and worry that they will miss their time to respond to notices from their landlords or the court. Further, even when they are properly notified, many cannot travel to the housing court and cannot access the technology or navigate the bureaucracy needed to avoid in-person appearances. Because of this, expanding seniors' access to attorneys will not only help them effectively raise legal defenses, but will also allow them to overcome potential practical hurdles to their participation in the judicial process and alleviate a great deal of their stress and anxiety. In our experience, older New Yorkers are also exceptionally worried about the possibility of having to enter the shelter system. Not only can the shelters themselves be difficult to navigate and endure, but placement in a shelter or other temporary housing accommodation often requires a person to move away from the medical and social services which they become increasingly reliant upon as they age. Due to our clients' aforementioned mobility issues, even a re relocation, which most people would consider small, can create an impassable divide between an older adult and their community. Furthermore, many sp seniors that we speak with are living on fixed incomes, which place them slightly above 200% of the federal poverty guidelines, leading them ineligible for a right to counsel attorney while still unable to afford a private attorney to represent them. Disabled older veterans in particular fall into this category. Currently, if an older veteran receives a service-connected disability at a 90% or 100% rating, they are over income for the right to counsel program, meaning they are effectively denied an attorney based on injuries sustained during service. These are veterans who sacrifice the most in service of our country, and the compensation they receive because of their sacrifice currently shuts them out from receiving representation in an eviction proceeding. Removing this income cap would open access to a significant portion of this vulnerable population. Um, Allowing New Yorkers to age in place and remain vibrant members of their local communities is a goal that benefits everyone in our city. The Right to Counsel program has been a great help. We support expanding it. Thank you, Thank you so much, and we'll take your longer written testimony. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you. Uh, Janine Cahill-Jackson from the Legal Aid Society. Okay, and sorry, um, we can have Christian Gonzalez Rivera, Jack Kupferman, and Dara Adams all come up to the panel as well. And Janine, you can begin when you're ready. Thank you so much. Good afternoon. If you can just press the button at the bottom of the mic, yeah. Good way to start. <laughs> thank you so much. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Councilmember Hudson and Committee for the Aging um, for proposing these bills and for holding this hearing. My name is Janine Cahill-Jackson. I'm a supervising attorney at the Legal Aid Society, uh, specifically the Bronx Neighborhood Office, and I supervise our assigned council project, so the eviction prevention for seniors. So um, the Legal Aid Society is in support of this bill and has actually some suggestions to make it even perhaps more robust. Um, first, addressing uh, increasing legal representation for seniors. We uh, add an emphatic yes to this um, with a but. 
However, currently with the level of funding, I have three attorneys and one paralegal, two of whom of which are here with me today. And we're receiving court referrals, meaningful court referrals of seniors that have fallen through the cracks of many systems and find themselves in eviction. When my paralegal does the intake interview, finding them without food, without any support services, often being um, follow, you know, separated from their community and housing court is the way the systems find them. Um, we're not able to take all of these cases under the current 200% federal income poverty guidelines. So while, yes, absolutely, we would like to see even more seniors eligible, at the current funding levels, it would be more people deemed eligible without being able to access services because the additional legal services couldn't um, hold that additional capacity. Uh, so we would um, support also if the bill could include um, more robust funding for right to counsel for seniors under 200 percent of the federal income poverty guideline and perhaps an entire removal of the subject of appropriation for legal services um, for seniors um, additionally the multi-pronged uh, approach looking at also rent arrears and case management is hugely valuable and um, currently in regards to the rent arrears um, it could benefit um, those that aren't otherwise eligible for uh, the one-shot deal from HRA which is the main source of rental arrears assistance could be those without immigration status or possibly not able to afford ongoing rent but the larger problem here is it's just a band-aid another gap in funding for keeping seniors financially in their homes is uh, an ongoing rental subsidy. Currently there is city FEPS, but you must qualify for APS services. And so that's only the most severely disabled adults that also meet all of the various APS criteria, leaving many seniors that could afford their homes perhaps before their partner died or circumstances changed, now in need of an ongoing rental subsidy to be able to maintain their housing. And then lastly, in regards to case management, <laughs> you can continue. Thank you. Um, the assigned counsel project, as um, uh, Commissioner from DIFTA uh, referenced, uh, does pr uh, DIFTA provides uh, limited social work services in the Brooklyn and Manhattan, um, but not in the Bronx, Queens, or Staten Island. So currently, we have no social work support or any other case management um, for our seniors, and so any increase of uh, this type of service would be very meaningful. And to just add to some of the, uh, to add some suggestions to that portion would be that this uh, program that's being proposed in the legislation would be a partner with the legal services provider. So not simply a referral portal, because right now all of the agencies that do provide help that we could refer to are overburdened as well. So we need additional resources of the provision of assistance, not simply referrals. Uh, some identified areas, and I'll be submitting longer written testimony after this uh, for your review, but uh, could be helping seniors locate suitable housing when they have to move, whether it's on the private market or applying for affordable housing, uh, document collection, application, and recertification to get and maintain their subsidies for their particular housing and in their cases. Uh, these are all, none of these should be reasons why seniors get evicted, such as not being able to provide a timely bank statement, but in the reality there are many seniors facing eviction for just that. And the hardship to just get to the bank, to get the bank statement can be insurmountable. Absolutely. So thank you very much for thank your Thank you, thank you for that um, feedback. I know my office has been in touch, so we'll continue to, to discuss ways that we can improve the legislation. Thank you. Thank you. Christian? Yep. Okay, um, good, uh, good afternoon now. Actually, good afternoon, Chair Hudson and, and everyone else. So my name is Cristian Gonzalez Rivera, uh, and I'm the policy director at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging. Let me just make this clear. Um, I'm the policy director at the Brookdale Center for Healthy Aging at Hunter College. Um, so the Brookdale Center supports the spirit of all of the uh, pieces of legislation um, introduced in the package, and we'd like to direct our comments to intros 1650 and 1696 in particular. So intro 1650, as you know, uh, would entitle New Yorkers age 60 plus to full legal representation in housing court, uh, expand rental uh, arrears assistance, 
establish a housing uh, support program. So the need for these services are pretty clear for many of the reasons that have already been mentioned. And I'd like to add one more, and that is that almost half of New Yorkers age 60 plus have been living in their homes for over a decade. So that's far beyond uh, people who are younger. So it's been mentioned many times that, of course, I mean, the housing crisis affects all of us as New Yorkers, but older adults in particular have been embedded in their communities for a long time and depend on those social supports. Um, so anyway, that's just one more reason why this is critical. Um, so thank you for introducing that bill. Uh, 1696 would require older adult centers to expand their cultural and linguistic uh, programs. So while we support this, the, uh, the spirit of the bill, again, I mean, we have some concerns about the process outlined about how to get the information to, um, to support this. Um, having each older adult center um, administer a survey would be pretty burdensome, a pretty burdensome way to get um, that service information. Um, I mean, cre creating and disseminating a survey and compiling a result, and the result is a very time consuming process. And it's also largely unnecessary because the census can give you all the information that you need. Um, in order to, to make these service uh, determinations. Um, and moreover, you know, older adult uh, center catchment areas really vary in size significantly, so a one mile radius won't catch everybody. Um, so there are ways to do this. So really the better way to, to be able to get the information you need is to actually use DIFTA's pre, uh, very capable research department. Uh, which has this information or has access to all this information. They know the catchment areas, they know um, how to run the numbers on all those catchment areas, um, and that would just be the easiest way to do it. Uh, so basically, DIFTA can focus on what they do best, providing this planning information, and the older adult centers can, can focus on what they do best, which is uh, providing the, the services that are needed. Um, so with DIFTA support, older adult centers can then make the necessary partnerships, and this is really important, can make the necessary partnerships and the program adjustments that would allow them to successfully reach these populations and do outreach to these populations. So thank you, um, Council Member Hudson, for your careful attention to these really important needs. Um, and we believe with the adjustments that we're recommending that um, this legislation could really make a positive difference. And thank you for the opportunity to testify as well. Thank you so much. Mm. Tara? Tara? Thank Thank you, Chair Hudson and members of the committee for the opportunity to testify. My name is Dara Adams, and I'm the Director for Strategic Policy Initiatives at Met Council. I'm honored to be here today on behalf of my colleague, Susan Moritz, the Senior Director for Holocaust and Geriatric Services at Met Council. Met Council is America's largest Jewish nonprofit organization dedicated to fighting poverty. We also run the largest kosher food distribution program in the world. For 50 years, Met Council has provided comprehensive social services to New Yorkers in need. Last year, Met Council provided food and wraparound services to more than 300,000 New Yorkers. Met Council's Elder Abuse Prevention Program began in response to an increase in the number of older adults requesting assistance after being financially exploited. Modeled after Met Council's services to survivors of intimate partner violence, we offer wraparound services that include education, prevention screening, care planning, assistance in, order, in obtaining orders of protection, financial assistance, and supportive counseling. Working closely with the Family Justice Centers, DA's offices, and local law enforcement, our elder abuse prevention works with survivors in all five boroughs in English, Spanish, Russian, and Ukrainian. Older adults are more vulnerable to exploitation and abuse than the average adult, a trend that has only worsened during the pandemic. In general, one in 10 older adults 60 plus experience abuse, including financial exploitation every year. Since the beginning of the COVID pandemic, the prevalence of elder abuse has increased to at least one in six, though exact numbers are difficult to confirm because one in 24 cases of elder abuse are not reported. A recent study found 83.6% increase in one-year abuse prevalence for adults age 60 and older. Given the rise in elder abuse, Met Council is excited to see the New York City Council taking significant steps to protect our seniors. Seniors need to be empowered to make decisions and knowing their rights is a meaningful first step towards that goal. Many of our clients facing eviction will greatly benefit from legal representation and expanded rental arrears assistance for persons 60 years or older. We're also extremely supportive of the establishment of a housing support program for persons 60 years of age or older who are at risk of eviction or foreclosure. We believe this program will help more seniors to be able to stay in their homes. 
We would urge the council to pass and fully fund this legislation as it has the potential to be life-changing for a countless number of older adults. We thank you for your commitment to addressing elder abuse and look forward to partnering with you to make the city safer for all seniors. Thank you. Jack? Thank you so much. Thank you so much for the invitation to present the views of Grey Panthers on the suite of bills under consideration. I am Jack Kupferman, president of Grey Panthers NYC. Since 1970, when Maggie Kuhn created the Grey Panthers, the organization has stood firm to combat ageism in the workplace and wherever it rears its ugly head. We're here today to continue in that tradition. We believe that the expansion of access to legal services for older persons 60 plus fills an important gap in service for New Yorkers. It's no surprise that the plague of COVID has resulted in a tidal wave of death and destruction, as well as an avalanche of rent arrears and potential evictions, acutely felt by older New Yorkers. Among the intros presented the expansion of the city's right to counsel program, as well as expansion of a city funded one shot deal piques our interest. It has the possibility of having the greatest positive impact for older New Yorkers. Of particular interest in this bill is the inclusion of legal services for foreclosure issues, not only for renters. This has always been a deficit in access to justice for older New Yorkers of limited means. They are unfamiliar with the intricacies of accessing services. It's hard for anyone to deal with the trauma of foreclosure, let alone those who have never had to navigate the intricacies of the legal and mortgage systems. So often, foreclosure proceedings begin when older homeowners have inadvertently failed to pay property taxes or missed mortgage payments. This legislation gives an opportunity to address the inequities of representation and access to justice. Mortgage companies have extensive legal services. Struggling older homeowners do not. Legal services for older New Yorkers have always been woefully inadequate. It's about time that we seek to enhance access to services and to better ensure that New Yorkers can age in place. Equally important, is the provisions in the legislation in this legislation is understanding that case management is an as ignored yet essential service to work towards resolving housing and other crises. Bravo for putting this important item into the centro. Let's refine this legislation to make it fiscally sound and administratively doable. We note that the key will be obtaining a secure and long-term funding stream. We've wanted to keep our comments short. Again, thank you for inviting us to speak regarding improving access to city services for older New Yorkers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you all. The next panel we'll call up is Tanya Krupat, Diane Rose, and that's it. Tanya, you can begin when you're ready. Um, thank you for the opportunity. If you can just press. Um, yeah, sorry, I think go. I just turned it off. Mm -hmm. <laughs> thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today. My name is Tanya Krupat. The vice, I'm the vice president of policy and advocacy at the Osborne Association. For decades, our organization has been providing services to those in the criminal legal system. My testimony focuses on older New Yorkers returning from incarceration. Today, more than one in five people in New York State prisons are over age 50. Hundreds of older people sit on Rikers right now. And due to the phenomenon of accelerated aging, 50 is the age that we use to, decide, to, to define someone incarcerated as older. The trauma that preceded incarceration, plus the trauma of incarceration, including decades of unhealthy food, lack of exercise, lack of age-appropriate health care, disconnection from family, and perpetual stress and anxiety, age a person beyond their years. While the most important people for you to hear from on this topic are older New Yorkers themselves, my testimony includes their input and guidance. 
Since a major barrier faced is stigma, I also want to start by sharing that the older New Yorkers I know, who collectively have served hundreds of years of incarceration, are my mentors and inspiration. They are wise, energetic, passionate advocates for justice and equity. They care deeply about building community, repairing harm, and contributing towards a world full of love, forgiveness, opportunity, family, and fairness. Recognize the needs of older New Yorkers returning from incarceration. In 2017, the City Council passed a resolution creating the Compassionate Assistance for Returning Elders Care Task Force. Led by MOCJ and DIFTA and including service providers including Osborne and formerly incarcerated leaders, the task force developed recommendations which focused on three main areas, aging services, health and mental health, and housing. Within these important topics, Within these important these areas, topics such as isolation, technology, stigma and discrimination, and access to identification and health care benefits were all addressed. And my written testimony includes more information on all of these. One important recommendation that came directly from a formerly incarcerated elder was to have a one-stop reentry center specifically for older people. Specific to the critical issue of housing, models exist. Um, that should be invested in and replicated. Osborne recently opened the Marcus Garvey Permanent Reentry Housing in Brooklyn. The Fortune Society has long had the castle, and Osborne will soon open the Fulton Community Reentry Center in the Bronx in the coming months. Fulton will provide 135 transitional housing beds for older adults, where they will receive support in navigating their return and transitioning to permanent housing. We also support the Fortune Society's application to develop a vacant building at Jacoby Hospital in the Bronx, which will create 50 supportive housing apartments for formerly incarcerated older adults who have serious medical needs. Um, I want to uh, discuss today, we support your intro 1650 and also the Fair Chance for Housing Bill, sponsored by Councilmember Powers. For older New Yorkers to be able to access city services, the age of eligibility should be considered, should consider accelerated aging. I'm almost done. Um, since those who are, re are returning from incarceration, um, again, the aging, we really consider to begin at 50, and uh, we call on DIFTA and the city council to considering lower the age. Finally, we commend you, the aging chair, for your leadership in sponsoring the introduction of the city council resolution calling on the state legislature to pass the elder parole and fair and timely parole bills for there are many aging people in prison who we need to come home right now. Respectfully, we also ask this committee to hold a hearing focusing on older adult reentry, which would include reinvigorating the care task force, examining the recommendations, and hearing from older New Yorkers themselves. Thank you so much for your leadership. Thank you so much for your testimony. Diane? Yes. We're ready for you. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, and I'm glad to be here as well. My name is Minister Dr. Diane Rose, and I represent uh, the Center for Economic and Enterprise Development as a organization, nonprofit organization, servicing aging individuals throughout the country as well as a uh, faith-based organization entitled Anointed Faith Ministries. Our program for aging populations include that of grandparents and is entitled Aging Gracefully. So I'd like to start with having listened to the wonderful testimony and thank you so much for your great questions. Those were right on target uh, with what is the city's plan for aging gracefully in the city. And we look at that as a wellness plan. We look at that holistically. We look at it not cutting people into pieces, focusing on areas of social vulnerabilities, et cetera. We look at it as an opportunity to create a thriving, robust community beginning at the age of 55 plus. So many of us are aging gracefully are aging to begin with. And so our focus, again, is to look at individuals from that perspective. We are all aging in community. Right now, uh, the focus has been primarily on older adults. Older adult supportive services are robust and primarily focused on health and providing health care. However, the, that only takes up about 20% of the aging population. 
there are uh, more individuals who do not qualify for what we call poverty programs and therefore are left out of an opportunity to support whether or not it's their health, their housing, their uh, social as well as economic needs. So I thought I would present my testimony. I didn't know how long I had, but three minutes is not going to cut it. <laughs> so I'm going to submit you can also it in submit writing. written testimony. However, what I would like to add as we think about programming and as I listen to the testimony is what is the strategic plan? What are the goals? And how do we monitor those goals on a regular basis? And hopefully that's what the council begins to look like, hearing back from these achievements and, you know, what exactly are the outcomes. One thing I do know is there is, and I would like to finish this piece because it's important, from an operational standpoint, there are just way too many barriers. And time takes way too long for need to be met. And so from that perspective, as we think about how services and programs are delivered, then are we measuring what those deliverables are in a way that shows an improvement in a person's life? Otherwise, what we've experienced and what I've experienced personally as an older adult, so I like to think of myself as an older New Yorker, is the absence of all these wonderful things you hear about in a seamless, uh, barrier-free process. So operationally, it's just bad. And so you have people that are waiting for years to access, for example, what you describe for eviction moratoriums even before an eviction proceeding occurs. And so I'm going to add the rest to my testimony uh, in writing, but one thing I would say is that there is a, an urgency from an aging perspective to reverse the trends that we are seeing that 10 years from now, not even 10 anymore, it's eight years from now, Absolutely, is only going to increase. And so I wanna thank you again for leading such powerful legislation. I reached out to your office and thank your office for at least hearing outside of the community from an aging individual, which is also important. And so thanks for having me. Thank you, me. thank you so much. Thank you both for your testimony. Before we move on to Zoom panelists, is there anyone in this room who would like to testify but has not done so? No? Okay. So we'll move on to Zoom panelists. We have... Shahila Stevens, MJ Okma, Leisha Lou Kai, and Nicole Brown in the first panel. As a reminder, uh, everyone has three minutes, and Shahila, you can begin. Your time will begin. Hello, can you all hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, thank you all for having me. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Shahila Stevens, and I'm the Senior Director of Programs at Encore Community Services, a nonprofit serving older adults on Manhattan's west side with a wide range of services. We appreciate the opportunity to, today to discuss improving older New Yorkers' access to city services. Our team faces challenges every day trying to provide access to the resources older New Yorkers need. The top two service requests that our case managers experience are financial support around entitlement benefits and housing security. The two case managers based out of our flagship older adult center near Times Square, which serves over a thousand seniors per year, are consistently booking appointments for seniors two months out. This doesn't include our walk-in crisis intervention with around roughly 10 to 15 seniors a day. This means significant delays in getting seniors the support they deserve, especially as it relates to eviction prevention services. Oftentimes, seniors have to be actively in the eviction process to receive support. 
which is counterintuitive to make seniors be near rock bottom before they can receive assistance. Recognizing the need for additional services amongst our community, last year we hired a financial navigator to join our team thanks to private funding. We saw an instant demand for services in this area and he quickly over, was overwhelmed with the needs of our older adults, again, forcing him to schedule new intakes about two months out. For years, we have needed more resources dedicated to case management, as well as more resources broadly to provide wraparound services at older adult centers. Efforts by the city expand offerings, expanding offerings have been hampered by a lack of funding um, to actually carry out the goals. Our team at Encore Community Services also regularly runs into extraordinary difficult situations when trying to secure appropriate housing for community-based seniors in need due to the lack of available units specifically designated for older adults in affordable housing and permanent supportive housing developments. The lack of available units leads to excessively long wait lists. For example, our wait list at our affordable housing building Encore West is over five years. We have experienced a significant increase in seniors who need assistance navigating housing issue, issues such as housing security, pest, infest, pest infestation, and overall unsafe living environments. Our case managers have received multiple referrals from Councilwoman Richardson Jordan, Councilman Botcher's office, and Councilman Brewer. Councilwoman Brewer. They attempted to navigate the city's 311 system to file complaints in support of the seniors, and case managers have also had to navigate landlord tenant issues outside of their skill set as many housing support organizations are overwhelmed and cannot respond in a timely manner to assist the seniors who are facing eviction. Case managers have also come across seniors who are no longer capable of caring for themselves in a safe manner resulting in referrals to adult protective services. In Encore's case, none of our referrals have been addressed to our knowledge. A particularly critical concern we have about access to services is related to the current limitations in supportive housing settings. At our supportive housing development on 39, we serve seniors. I'm sorry. That's okay. Time, yeah, but, time is up, but you can submit the rest of your written testimony. Absolutely, will do. Thank you. Thank you so, so much. MJ? Your time will begin. Yeah. Good afternoon. My name is MJ Okma with SAGE, the country's first and largest organization dedicated to improving the lives of LGBTQ plus and HIV affected older people. In addition to our network of older adult centers across New York City, SAGE is the on-site service provider at New York's first LGBTQ plus welcoming affordable housing developments located in Brooklyn and the Bronx. There are over 250,000 LGBTQ plus elders in New York State, and 60% of New Yorkers living with HIV are over the age of 50. These populations are both growing rapidly as more LGBTQ plus and HIV positive adults continue to age. Due to histories of trauma and systemic discrimination, LGBTQ plus older people and those living with HIV face pronounced rates of social isolation, poverty, and lack of access to culturally competent services and support compared to their straight, cisgender, and HIV negative counterparts. These challenges only compound for transgender elders and LGBTQ plus elders of color. Due to the growth of these populations, higher rates of health disparities, and the disproportionate impact COVID-19 has had on LGBTQ plus elders, there is a growing need for LGBTQ plus and HIV competent aging services that must be met with both funding and policy to ensure that all elders have equitable access to the supports they need to age in place. Because LGBTQ plus elders are less likely to rely on biological family or children for informal caregiving support, they often need to rely more heavily on community service providers for care as they age. Yet they're often distrustful providers based on past and current experiences of discrimination. In addition, many LGBTQ plus elders of color and immigrants often find themselves in environments that offer few supports in their native languages and lack knowledge and respect for their cultural customs. It is incredibly important that LGBTQ plus and HIV aging services are available in a culturally and linguistically competent manner. Access to affordable housing is also a major concern for LGBTQ plus elders who are more likely to face discrimination in elder living communities and often have histories of housing insecurity and homelessness. 34% of LGBTQ plus older people and 54% of transgender and gender nonconforming older people fear having to recloset themselves when seeking elder housing in order to avoid discrimination. This further stresses the importance of support and legal resources to ensure LGBTQ plus elders can age in their communities and have access to LGBTQ plus welcoming affordable housing developments. 
While LGBTQ plus people and long-term survivors of HIV are resilient, they encounter unique challenges as they age um, and have severe negative health, economic, and social implications. We look forward to working with Chair Hudson and the City Council on the pre-considered bills on the agenda today and future bills to ensure that LGBTQ plus elders and older New Yorkers living with HIV have the support they need to age in place with dignity and respect. Thank you so much for holding this important hearing and providing me this opportunity to testify. Thank you so much. Alicia? Your time will begin. Thank you, Chair Hudson and members of the AG Committee for holding this hearing and giving us an opportunity to testify. I'm Alicia Lukai, Advocacy Coordinator at the Asian American Federation. We're here today to discuss the le legislation that centers the needs of our seniors and the critical work of our service providers. Members of our seniors working group, the first Asian senior service focused coalition in New York State, led by AAF, are the experts on the ground and understand the needs of our most vulnerable. Language accessibility and cultural competency is what drives their fight, and we're glad these issues are top of mind today. Our 12 Asian-led, Asian senior serving member organizations comprising the Seniors Working Group served nearly 250,000 Asian seniors in 2021, 87,000 of whom were low income. Asian seniors comprise 13.9% of the city's senior population, and the number of Asian seniors in poverty increased by 63.4% between 2010 and 2019, the largest percent increase of any major racial group. Of our seniors in poverty, 29% live alone and 80% have limited English proficiency. The Seniors Working Group surveyed over 150 Asian senior clients about their greatest challenges and the needs in the fall of 2021. With the data of the survey, we focus on these categories, safety from anti-Asian violence, access to direct services at senior centers, access to food programs, and combating mental health and social isolation. Our CBL stated that in order to meet the needs of our seniors, there must be systemic change for culturally competent, effective services. This means the city should support, reinforce, and build capacity for programming by and for marginalized communities by prioritizing cultural competence and language access throughout the policymaking process. In many cases, culturally competent programming comes directly from older adult centers, a place where many seniors call a second home. And in many instances, these older adult centers are providing services to underserved communities and are receiving clients from across the city, not just their local neighborhoods. These centers are where our aging New Yorkers eat their meals, see their friends, and spend many of their waking hours because our CBOs provide linguistically, culturally, and financially accessible resources that Asian seniors can actually take advantage of the way they need them. Especially in a community as diverse as our pan-Asian community, many smaller ethnic communities or more widely dispersed ethnic communities struggle to find services that fit their needs. And when they do find what they need, they stay and they build relationships and roots. We have a few recommendations. Um, prioritize community-led older adult center running organizations in policymaking, especially those serving under those serving undeserved and isolated ethnic and linguistic communities. Many of these communities require specific service approaches and are often dispersed throughout the city. Similarly, some organizations and older adult centers are uniquely equipped to serve and focus on their needs. To increase funding for Asian-led, Asian-serving older adult service providers and expand this funding to include time and expense spent on case management and digital literacy, devices, and training. Even though funding has historically prioritized mainstream organizations, our marginalized older adults have always come first to our Your CBOs time, to access services they actually take advantage of. Um, on behalf of the Asian American Federation, thank you for raising up the work that needs to be done and for prioritizing the voices and needs of our seniors. Thank you so much. Nicole, your time will begin. Thank you. Good, good afternoon. My name is Nicole Brown, and I am the director of one of Greenwich House's five older adult centers. Thank you, Chair Hudson and members of the New York City Council Committee on Aging for this opportunity to testify. Since Greenwich House was founded in 1902, we have been committed to addressing the needs of children, families, individuals, and older adults working to overcome life challenges, <clears throat> through arts and education programs, health services, and older adult services. Greenwich House is proud to operate a network of five older adult centers in Manhattan, offering our members vital social, educational, physical, and cultural resources. We applaud this committee for seeking opportunities to approve older New Yorkers access to city services. <clears throat> Investments in older adults in the fiscal year 23 adopted budget 
were a great place to start, as is the legislative package being introduced today, which promotes housing stability, knowledge of rights, and culturally relevant services for older New Yorkers. But as the aging population continues to be the fastest growing demographic, with one in five New Yorkers expected to be 60 and older by 2040, the city must go further to ensure all older New Yorkers have access to equitable aging services. As providers of older adult services, Greenwich House sees several opportunities to improve older New Yorkers' access to city services. Among the top additional and critical needs that we see every day, funding better transportation alternatives such as creative, on-demand, flexible, and wheelchair accessible transportation service, linking a network of older adult centers would give seniors more opportunity to partake in the services, classes, or meals they need to thrive. Helping make New Yorkers more fine and connect to the service they need is important just as, we, just as we are all making increased collective investments in these supports. Investing in upgrades and repairs beyond just emergency fixes to the buildings and spaces that house older adult services would dramatically help support both the people we serve and the organizations providing those services. Additional investments in workforce training, services, and support geared towards older adults is also a tremendous and area of opportunity, excuse me, of opportunity. For our part, we at Greenwich House, and with funding with the support from DIFSA, are set to launch an intergenerational workforce program this fall that is particularly sensitive to the needs of New Yorkers over the age of 60. We think seniors across the city could benefit from such programming. We also continue to explore creative funding solutions for program space repairs and upgrade transportation options for our members and finding new and creative ways to reach older adults who might benefit from these services and support. But in the working system, these are elements that government funding partners, legislative and executive would recognize in advance. Greenwich House applauds the New York City Council and the Committee on Aging for seeking ways to improve access to city your services for all the community members. I'm almost done. And I thank the committee for your advocacy for older New Yorkers and for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, the next panel will be Jose Vega, Vic Benson, and Kimberly George. Your time will begin. Hello. Hello, good afternoon, and thank you for allowing my person to testify today. My name is Jose Vega. I'm disabled and wheelchair-bound, level T3 paraplegic, paralyzed from my chest down. I also have asthma, sleep apnea, seizures, and various other medical issues. As an older adult and resident of New York City, changes need to be made to improve the living conditions for the older adults of New York City. For example, the New York City shelter system is not equipped to house the older adult especially ones who also have disabilities with medical issues. They are not ADA accessible to meet one's disabilities and medical needs. They are constantly being abused physically, threatened, and their, met and their personal items are being taken from them. Many of the New York City housing developments that house the older adults, the housing conditions that one is being provided with are inhumane, inappropriate, not safe to house the older adults, especially those with disabilities and medical issues. The elevators are constantly breaking down for months at a time, forcing one to stay home because they can't use the stairways. The sinks, toilets, and household equipment is also breaking down and not prepared in a timely fashion. Also, during the winter months, they are not being provided with sufficient heat for the household. As an older adult coming home from prison, as myself and being disabled, I was not provided with housing, medical, clothing, or assistance. Better accommodations and assistance need to be provided for the older adult coming home from prison. Many of the New York City supermarket stores and entities built after 1990 do not meet the requirements of the ADA of, of 1990 to meet the older adults of New York City, especially ones with disability needs. Changes need to be made, especially the store aisles, ramps, entering the stores. Many of them, one can't even enter because they don't have ramps or the widths of the doors are not wide enough for the do older adult who depend on the wheelchairs or walkers. The Osborne Association recently provided 52 adults coming home from prison with affordable housing 
and Marcus Garvey Housing Development, located at 461 Chester Street, Brooklyn, New York, 11212, that meets the condition of one's needs. I finally was provided with appropriate housing that meet my disability needs and is in compliance with the ADA of 1990. After living with my parents for, four, for more than four years in an apartment that was not ADA accessible, thanks to the Osborne Association and Director, Ms. Christina Green. These are a few changes that need to be made for the older adults of New York City. Thank you very much, and change is possible. Appreciate it. Everyone have a blessed day. Thank you. <coughs> Vic? Your time will begin. I'm sorry. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. Uh, my name is Vic Benson, and I'm the policy analyst at City Meals on Wheels. City Meals works in partnership with the city and the network of home-delivered meal providers to fill the gap on the 115 days the city does not provide for by funding the delivery of meals on weekends, holidays, and emergencies to homebound older adults, alongside additional supplemental feeding and connective service programs. We currently serve over 20,000 homebound older adults, a 25% increase in distribution since the pandemic began. We know that our recipients and thousands of older adults live precariously and are often cut off from a myriad of services that are available but do not reach them because of requirements that necessitate showing up in person or accessing them online. And due to mobility or cognitive issues and a lack of technology, these points of access are particularly difficult for the home for homebound older adults to meet. Many of the aid services that the homebound are connected to struggle to serve them adequately. Only around half of eligible older adults are signed up for SCRE, and while 30% of HDM recipients are signed up for SNAP, with 90% of our recipients relying on mobility devices and 40% unable to leave their homes without assistance, they struggle to get to the store to spend their SNAP dollars and have difficulty using online ordering. And for our older immigrant population, the foods available through feeding programs are often not culturally competent. Older adults are the fastest growing demographic and one in seven older New Yorkers lives in poverty. The estimated cost of providing city meal services is $1.1 million for every 1,000 older adults we serve. And city meals has increased its funding to keep up with the number of older adults requiring a home delivered meal, but a possible influx of up to 3,000 new clients in FY23 due to the end of the gap food feeding program could create an insurmountable challenge to this model of service access. With older adults living longer and on fixed income, services for older adults to receive nutritious food is integral to their survival and should be a greater part of the food safety net. As programs serving homebound older adults have been consistently underfunded and underinvested in throughout the years. We support Chair Hudson's legislative package, and in all aid programs, we hope to see explicit provisions for ensuring homebound access to supportive services. We urge the council to adequately fund the existing home delivered meal case management and older adult nutrition network, excuse me, including a $3.3 million infusion for weekend and emergency meals. We also urge the expansion of technology, education, and access programs for homebound older adults to improve their ability to access services and access programming. And we support calls for an outreach campaign complete with registration assistance to raise awareness to and increase engagement for the benefits programs older adults are eligible for. This work is even more crucial in times of uncertainty and when facing crises like the COVID-19 pandemic or inevitable worsening climate-related crises. Together, we work to ensure that no older adult goes without food for a day in our city, and we hope that you, our partners in city government, will continue to help us advocate on behalf of those who are hidden behind closed doors to support better it's funding it's and access it's it's to basic services like food, internet, and technology necessary for for reaching additional services and emergency meals. We'll be submitting a, a longer written testimony. Thank you for the time. Thank you so much. Kimberly? Your time will begin. Good afternoon. Um, thank you, Chair Hudson and committee members for allowing me to, the opportunity to testify today. My name is Kimberly George. I'm the president and CEO of Project Guardianship. We are a nonprofit agency providing comprehensive court-appointed guardianship services to limited capacity New Yorkers citywide. We serve our clients regardless of their ability to pay for service and provide services for some of the most compelling and complex cases in the city. Our clients include New Yorkers living with disabilities, mental health disorders, dementia, substance use disorders, traumatic brain, brain injury, and other conditions that negatively impact our ability to make decisions. We also work to improve the guardianship system and advocate for more equitable services for people in need of protective arrangements. 
For older New Yorkers with limited capacity, the mental hygiene law provides for the appointment of a guardian to help them manage their personal and or property needs. Guardianship is a critical link between city services for older adults and those New Yorkers whose functional limitations have prevented them from accessing and benefiting from those programs. Nonprofit agencies like ours work to secure the public benefits, housing, health care, mental health care, and other services that this population needs to remain safe and stable and to allow them to age in place. However, there are almost no services to help loved ones assess the need for guardianship or provide support in the petitioning process. And there are obstacles to obtaining needed guardians when necessary to connect this population to vital programs and supports. We must therefore improve supports for friends and family members who step up to serve as guardian. It can be very challenging for a guardian, particularly one who is unfamiliar with the various systems that they must navigate to successfully fulfill their responsibilities. New York City should invest in training and support um, for non-professional guardians in identifying, obtaining, and maintaining the full scope of services available to the people under their care. When there is no family member or friend willing or able to serve as guardian, the courts rely on a patchwork of professional guardians, nonprofit organizations, and even the local Department of Social Services in certain jurisdictions. New York City should lead and create a dedicated funding stream to support nonprofit guardianship services will th- will, will thus enable older New Yorkers to access the benefits and services to which they are entitled. We are working to create a city where everyone who enters the guardianship system does so truly as a last resort, where guardians have the resources and support to provide person-centered services, and where where these expectations are met regardless of zip code or whether the person has significant savings or is an SSI recipient. This is... This is only possible if we invest in guardianship as a social service and provide support to those with functional limitations and to their guardians. With your continued support, we will be able to make New York City the equitable, age-inclusive, and age-friendly place it strives to be, where everyone can access and benefit from the city's services regardless of their limitations or other challenges. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Uh, Just a reminder that folks can submit written testimony within the next 72 hours to testimony at council.nyc.gov. I'd now like to invite Ravi Reddy to testify. Ravi, are you logged in? Okay. At this time, this concludes our public testimony. If you are on Zoom and your name has not been called and you still wish to testify, please raise your hand using the Zoom raise hand function. Okay, seeing none, we have concluded public testimony for this hearing. I'd like to thank everyone who has submitted testimony. Uh, We take all of the suggestions uh, and recommendations to make our legislation seriously and look forward to working with all of the advocates who've shared such suggestions and recommendations um, in order to make this legislation and the package of these bills the best possible. Um, And thank you, everyone, again, who also showed up to our rally this morning in advance of today's hearing. Um, This concludes the hearing for today. Thank you so much.